Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Anaheim Elementary School District January 26th board meeting. I'm ASD President Juan Gabriel Alvarez, and I call this meeting to order at 5 p.m. This, this meeting is being conducted in person and by means of live video broadcast on our Anaheim Elementary YouTube channel for members of the public. Para Español puede conectarse por teléfono de la siguiente manera. Llame al 484-416-2068. Cuando se le pida, presione el PIN o la clave 820-023-650 y la tecla numeral. Any member of the public has an opportunity to address the board in person during the agendized public comment session or may choose to submit their public comments in written by 12 p.m. the day of the board meeting via an electronic form. Comments submitted online will be read during the appropriate agendized public comment session. Let's begin with the board roll call. I have board member Mark A. Lopez. Present. <laughs> Thank you. Board member Dr. Paulo Megales. Good evening, everyone. Present. Board member Ryan Rollis. Hello. Board clerk Jackie Philbeck. Present. And like I said before, I'm uh, President Juan Gabriel Alvarez. Um, and we're moving on to public, public speakers for closed session agenda items. There are no public comment, uh, public speakers for the closed session agenda items that were received as of today. Um, so let's move to adjournment to closed session. Do I have a motion to adjourn the closed session? So moved, Rellis. So I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor of moving to closed session, say aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Let's go to closed session. because of the social distance thing. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Anaheim Elementary School District January 26th board meeting. I'm AESD President Juan G. Alvarez. I call this meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. This meeting is being conducted in person by means of live video broadcast on our Anaheim Elementary YouTube channel for the members of the public. 
Spanish interpretation of the board meeting is available to uh, attendees. Para español, uh, puede contactarse por conectarse por teléfono de la siguiente manera. Llame al 484-416-2068. Cuando se le pida, presione el PIN o la clave 820-023-650 y la tecla numeral. Let's begin with our flag salute. Thank you, Dr. Downing. <laughs> okay, let's move on to our introductions and roll call. All right, to my right, uh, we have board member Mark Lopez. Good evening, uh, present. Next, we have board member Dr. Paula McCullis. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Happy New Year. Board member Ryan A. Ruelas. Hello. Board clerk Jackie Philbeck. Good evening. I'm Board President Juan Alvarez, and we have Dr. Downing, our superintendent, to my left. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Mary Gray, super, uh, Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services. Hello, good evening. Uh, Dina Melland, Assistant Superintendent of Human Services. Good evening. Uh, uh, tonight we have Jesse Chavarria not present. Uh, we have our Senior Director of School and Safety Operations, Tracy Golden. Good evening, everyone. Senior Administrative Assistant, Iris Camacho. Hello, everybody. And our interpreters in the back, we have Mary Madrigal and Alina Avila Roque. And our technology support technician, Janice Cato, also in the room somewhere. Yeah, there you are. And Brian Brooks, media services superv supervisor, is also here, running it in the back room over there. <laughs> and then we also ha have Daryl Hutchinson, media production specialist. All right, so report of closed session action items taken, none. Let's move on to the adoption of the agenda. Uh, can I get a motion for the adoption of the agenda? So moved. And a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? All right, all in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion, motion carries 5-0. All right, let's move on to special order of business. There are none. Um, item five, news updates. Uh, let's start with parent leadership group updates. We've, we have a, a special presentation today from Laura Houston, a teacher on special assignment and PTA treasurer, Jesse Alvarez. Welcome, thank you. Uh, this is regarding the uh, National PTA Reflections Program. And we had 462-ish uh, participants this year. All 24 schools participated. And we would just like to recognize the winners. And you all know this is uh, my friend and amazing PTA volunteer. Jessie Alvarez, she's our treasurer, and she is the backbone behind this entire uh, art contest. And she goes way above and beyond and is responsible for uh, getting the, the trophies and the certificates. She does much more than I do, but I'm speaking <laughs> instead. So um, I just wanted to, I think we should just go ahead and start. We have a lot of students waiting. So why don't, I'd like to welcome our first group, Thien Thien is going to lead the We're first 10 students the, um, in. Board to come help and recognize our students. Photo. 
Okay, so we have Tian Tian Win, which was our award of excellence for the primary film production representing the Anaheim Elementary Online Academy. Okay, we have Eleanor Medina, who received our Award of Merit for the Middle School Film Production, representing the Anaheim Elementary Online Academy. She is, she is not present, but maybe she is watching virtually. <laughs> okay, and then we have Angela Liu, who received honorable mention in the Intermediate Visual Arts, also from our Anaheim Elementary Online Academy. We have Jordan Wynn, Award of Excellence for Middle School Music Composition from Barton Elementary. We have Ethan Wynn, Award of Excellence for Middle School Photography from Barton Elementary. Michael Torres, Award of Merit for Special Artist Visual Arts from Preschool Edison Elementary. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Okay, so we have Isabella Miranda, Award of Excellence, Primary Music Composition from Franklin Elementary. <laughs> Eddie Aguilar, Award of Excellence, Middle School Literature from Franklin Elementary. Arely Avalos, Honorable Mention, Middle School Visual Arts from Gower Elementary. <laughs> Julian Mendoza, Award of Excellence, Primary Visual Arts from Gwen Elementary. <laughs> okay, congratulations to all of our students.
<laughs> okay. Yes, all the parents from Group B, come on in, have a seat. Just giving them a moment to get settled. Yes. And then we'll go ahead and take pictures with the whole group at the end, okay, for all of our parents in the audience. Okay, so congratulations to all of our students. We are awarding, uh, recognizing Cecilia Claudio, Award of Merit for Middle School Literature from Henry Elementary. Amber O, Award of Excellence for Middle School Visual Arts from Juarez Elementary. <laughs> oh, uh, we're, uh, Valentina Portillo, Award of Excellence for Special Artist Visual Arts from Juarez Elementary. And we have um, the dad of Karina Christie, for Award of Excellence for Middle School Dance Choreography from Juarez Elementary. She cannot be here today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Ali Gibran, Award of Excellence for Primary Literature from Juarez Elementary. Marco O'Sullivan, Award of Merit for Intermediate Literature from Juarez Elementary. And he is watching from home. Congratulations. Adrian Barrios, Award of Merit for Primary Photography from Juarez Elementary. Jaden Galavis, Honorable Mention for Primary Visual Arts from Juarez Elementary. Oh, <laughs> you can give everybody a fist bump. <laughs> Alyssa Alvarado, Honorable Mention for Middle School Photography from Juarez Elementary. Congratulations. Isaiah Miranda, Award of Merit for Intermediate Music Composition from Marshall Elementary. Okay, so at this time, parents, if you'd like to take photos. Okay, congratulations again to our students, and then we'll have everyone follow out this way. Everyone will exit out that door. Thank you. Welcome to all of our parents. You may have a seat. And then we'll 
take a moment to take a picture of that. I'll make sure Sandra takes one when it's in public. <laughs> Take one when you're <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for your patience, Okay, welcome everyone. Congratulations to all of our students that participated this year. I know not everyone got to, gets to hear this bill from the very beginning, so I apologize. Um, but thank you for being here to recognize your students. So first up, we have Wesley Alberg, Award of Excellence for Intermediate Film Production from Lincoln Elementary. We have Victor Camacho, Award of Excellence for Intermediate Photography from Lincoln Elementary. We have Hannah Montiel, Honorable Mention for Intermediate Music Composition from Lincoln Elementary. We have Marcos Oliveros, Honorable Mention for Intermediate Literature from Lincoln Elementary. We have Reese Alvarez, Award of Excellence for Primary Photographer from Mann Elementary. Steven Valdez, Award of Excellence for Intermediate Dance Choreography from Mann Elementary. We have Haley Leal, Award of Merit for Middle School Photography from Mann Elementary. We have Lucy Romo Padilla, honorable mention for primary visual arts from Mann Elementary. <laughs> we have Alyssa Jones, award of excellence for middle school film production from Price Elementary. I believe not present, we have Abigail Vasquez, honorable mention for intermediate photography from Price Elementary. Okay, parents, you're more than welcome to, oh, you wanna, on her behalf? Thank you. Principal. Thank you. <laughs> we, she has a, she has a, a, a word as well. Yes. Thank you. So if you guys wanna go ahead and take pictures, you can take pictures of the group. Congratulations to all of our students. Okay, congratulations again, and then everyone can exit out this exit door to your left. Thank you for coming. Welcome to all of our parents coming in right now. You can go ahead and have a seat. Okay. 
Thunder Rays put him in the D. Oh my god. Yes. Yeah. So I think they pushed it back to March now. So. I know. I know, me too. I'm like. <laughs> Um, as soon as we uh, finish reading out all the names, we'll give all of the parents in the audience uh, time to take photos. Okay? Again, thank you all for being here. Um, and congratulations to all of our participants in this year's reflection program. We had a lot of amazing talent in the district. We're very proud of you guys. Okay, so I'm going to call each student's name and they're going to go ahead and come up. So we have Alyssa Annan. Award of Excellence for Intermediate Dance Choreography from Jefferson Elementary. <laughs> Go ahead. We have Victoria Lozama, Award of Merit for Primary Visual Arts from Jefferson Elementary. We have Casey Ramos, Award of Merit for Middle School Visual Arts from Jefferson Elementary. Okay, we have Theodore Hershenson, Award of Excellence for Intermediate Music Composition from Revere Elementary. David Galindo, Award of Merit for Intermediate Photography from Roosevelt Elementary. Sylvia Wynn, Award of Merit for Intermediate Visual Arts from Ross Elementary. Zakaria Muthala, Award of Excellence for Intermediate Literature from Stoddard Elementary. We have Moises Miranda, Award of Merit for Intermediate Film Production from Stoddard Elementary. Lucas Le Rivera, Award of Merit for Primary Film Production, Transitional Kindergarten at Sunkist Elementary. Honorable Mention, Special Artist Visual Arts from Sunkist Elementary. Okay, congratulations to all of our artists. And parents, you may take pictures now. While everyone is taking photographs, I'm just going to say thank you to all the parents who helped support your students through this uh, PTA program. Thank you to the teachers and everyone. Thank you to the judges too, who shall remain anonymous. <laughs> but <laughs> I had, we had several judges as well who volunteered their time to judge. So thank you to everyone for making this possible. This is a, an art contest run by volunteers. So thank you. And everyone, if you'll join me in thanking Ms. Houston as well as Ms. Alvarez for their outstanding efforts to make reflections a reality during this time. And earlier it was announced there were approximately 426 entries from our district. So 
just outstanding. And thank you to all of the boys and girls and parents for you being here tonight. Thank you. To, to all of you who were in group D, thank you for waiting. Uh, last but not least, right? So I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, and then everyone can exit right this way to your left through that door. Thank you so much. And I just want to also really quickly thank our Board of Education um, for always the superintendent and always um, supporting the Reflections program and um, encouraging all of our schools to participate. So I have some Reflections pins for our board. And it's also board appreciation. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts from PTA. Always strong supporters. Okay, let's move on to uh, item 5B, association updates. There are no association updates tonight. 5C, district news and updates. There are district news and updates tonight from Dr. Mary Grace, Assistant Superintendent, Educational Services. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, and thank you to all of you who stayed for the news and updates. So last week, we were able to surprise some of our classified employees who were selected to represent the district at the county level for classified employees of the year. Here we have uh, Ms. Marta Lee. She's the school office coordinator at Stoddard Elementary. And Bertha Soto. She's a preschool instructional assistant at Sunkist. Also, we have Emily Hopper, a school safety assistant at Franklin Elementary School. Gabriela Fuentes, a licensed vocational nurse at Westmont Elementary. And Cesar Vargas, he works in our data and assessment team, uh, our data department, he's a technician. And Martha Hernandez, one of our bus drivers. So we congratulate and thank all of our classified employees. I know we'll be bringing all of the classified employees at a future date, but these were selected to represent the district. <laughs> and we have a lot of fun happening and learning happening in our after school expanded learning programs. Here are some pictures from Betsy Ross. They are running an amazing sta STEAM program. And these are just some of the pictures of the kids engaged in after-school activities. 
Um, looks like they got a mento and some Diet Coke and an explosion. Building some structures. And also, uh, beginning last week and continuing into this week, I guess it was just Monday, um, we have some media coverage of our Expanded Learning Opportunities Program. Um, we've had um, Fox News, CBS came out, um, Univision, Estrella TV, KFI, KNX, and Yahoo News. And we've had uh, Dr. Downing and Dr. Moreno out there um, with some parents and students talking about all of the great uh, uh, after-school activities. And it ranges from, we have Segerstam providing um, cultural experiences for our students. We have um, a program called Student uh, it's SLED, Student Leadership and Education. Uh, we have some debate going on. We have some tutoring, um, athletics. Um, it's a wonderful program at all of our schools. Uh, this can be seen on CBS2 and Telemundo. And then in Fox 11 and Estrella TV. And there's some more pictures and uh, the ones at Orange Grove, they have a cooking class and um, a coding program going on. So um, they also went out to Ponderosa and talked about their before school um, activities that they have for students and families. And that's our news and updates for this week, month. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Grace. Uh, next, we have uh, public speakers, speakers on agenda or non-agenda items. Uh, we have one submission today for a public uh, comment, and we have uh, Mr. Ian Jameson from the Los Angeles Leftists for Choice and uh, Gets Unity and Facts, Law, Truth, Justice. Welcome, Mr. Jameson. Good evening. Uh, I am Ian Jamison. I'm with Facts, Law, Truth, Justice, LLP, headed by attorney Nicole Pearson, and I also work with Los Angeles Leftists for Choice and Unity. Tonight I am speaking to the parents of Anaheim Elementary School District to support medical freedom. It is illegal under 21 U.S.C. Section 360 BBB 3E1823 to mandate emergency use authorization medical products. None of the COVID masks, none of the vaccines available, none of the PCR tests, none of any of this is legal under federal law. We have legal resources to enable you to fight back and defend your kids against this abuse. You can go to fltjllp.com and click on the resources tab. You can also contact me on Facebook at Ian Jamison and on Instagram at at LA anti mandate lefty. And I'll just conclude by saying that you all are totalitarian child abusing lunatics. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, moving on to item seven, superintendent's report. We're going to go with the uh, science adoption by uh, Corey Robertson, director of digital education services, and Megan Brown, the curriculum specialist. Good evening, board, president, and cabinet. Uh, my name is Corey Robertson, director of digital education services, and I'm joined today by Megan Brown, curriculum specialist for science and STEAM. We are very excited today to present to you the process uh, we've gone through to identify a science curriculum for our next adoption and the process that we went through with the committee and the committee's selection. So I'm gonna turn it over to Megan and she's gonna take us through the process we've gone through the past year. All right, good evening. So first, of all, I'm, first off, I'm gonna say I've had a wonderful time this past year working with um, all of our stakeholders here, with the parents, with the students in Anaheim, as well as teachers, and um, hoping to kind of show you a little bit of a glimpse into what this last year has looked like in terms of um, a recommendation for a science curriculum. So in, in our guiding force in trying to find the, cor the correct material that we wanted to recommend to you today, uh, we started with the standards because that's where we always need to start when we're looking at what we're trying to teach our students. That coupled with what's outlined in the framework in terms of teaching pedagogy and the performance expectations that we want our students to be able to show mastery really was what we were trying to whittle through and kind of right, find the right lens for our students in Anaheim as well as our teachers. And it was a really fun process that we got to um, go through in the past year. 
So a little bit about the next generation science standards. Um, these new standards are what we refer to as three-dimensional, which means that every single standard that the students are responsible for learning has some sort of engineering practice, which means students finally get to do something with science. And this is um, a definitely a shift from when I went to school. A lot of what I got when I went to school in terms of science was watching a teacher do a science lesson, maybe writing down words and definitions, and didn't really have an opportunity to explore anything on my own. If I did, it was kind of like a recipe where I'm following ingredients and everybody's science lesson looked the same. Um, now it's different. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to let our students get their hands on these new standards, which were actually written in 2013. So the standards prior to then were from 1998. Science changes so rapidly that depending on when you got your last science book, Pluto may be listed there as a planet, or it might be a dwarf planet, just depending on when your book was written and what standards it was using. So what we were looking to do is to update the materials that our students have and offer our students and teachers a curriculum that has different multiple modalities for learning. We know that not all students learn the same way and not all teachers teach the same way, and that's okay. And what this means is there's going to be some hands-on learning, some media, some interactions with students, and maybe even simulations if it's something that's not easily replicated in the classroom. This is all based on the fact that we have instructional shifts that have happened over the years with these new standards. We're trying to have opportunities for our students to think critically and to problem solve and to look at the world around them and wonder why. Less of the read about a text, memorize some facts, and regurgitate it on a test because we don't have the answers to everything around us. If we did, we would have a vaccine or we would have a situation where COVID doesn't exist anymore. But we have problems in the world and we need to learn how to ask questions to solve those problems and then what to do if it doesn't work. And so what we are looking for is a program that has those STEAM competencies for our students to really prepare them for the future. And we hope that what we're bringing to you today was a recommendation of a program that is going to show our students um, opportunities and jobs of what they could be when they grow up. Because the reality is, is if we don't expose our students to the different jobs that exist out there, they can't strive to become those, jo those jobs and have those careers if they don't know that they don't even exist. So we hope that the curriculum that we found will allow for our students to work together with one another to collaborate and communicate and solve problems and even ask questions because that's something that we need. So the community, the committee did a lot of prep work leading up to this. And like I said, it has been a little bit over a year. Um, it started in December of 2020, where we looked at the state approved science books that were out there. And there were a total of 29. And we whittled it down based off of some non-negotiables that we had through our lens here in Anaheim. Uh, first and foremost, we wanted to adopt a curriculum that included TK. We have never adopted a science curriculum that included them. And so it was very exciting for us to look at a program that spanned the scope from TK all the way to sixth grade. So we did not want to adopt a program that would leave us at fifth grade with one publisher and start a different one in sixth because it can be a little disjointed in the way that the words are written from curriculum to curriculum. And we know that there are combo classes. And so for us, we were looking at one that met all of the grades that we had here in Anaheim. Secondly, another non-negotiable is that we wanted um, DLI in Spanish to be available for every single grade. And so we wanted a curriculum that was strong in the language background and not one that was translated using Google, but one that was authentically trans translated for our DLI classes. We wanted an integrated approach as opposed to a um, discipline specific, meaning we're embedding it across the other areas of the curriculum and compatible with the devices we have in the district on iPads, Chromebooks, as well as Surface Go's. Because a lot of the curriculums that are out there have different components that um, need to be able to work across the different platforms. And lastly, we want it to be engaging, where our students are constantly in situations where they're watching media. And it takes, I think, seven seconds to lose a student's um, interest in what you're covering. So we were looking for something that would captivate them right from the get-go and would able, be able to hold their attention. 
So we started with that in December and we fast forward to February where we started meeting with the publishers and requesting samples and looking through their programs and then COVID hit. So what we did is we uh, were able to narrow it down to five publishers and we met um, using Zoom meetings for an hour and a half from each of the five publishers. Now the people that were present during these times were made up of the distance learning committee, which is um, some district personnel who were able to look through their lens of expertise to ask questions about um, different components of the text. When we were looking at assessments and if it met the requirements of the cast, if we were looking at access for all learners, looking for the dual language immersion support, looking for the technological piece, the gate and special ed as well. Um, we went through an evaluation piece and we were able to bring it down to five different publishers, which we shared with the CIA committee, which is the um, curriculum uh, instruction and assessment committee. And on that committee, we have teachers, we have district personnel, as well as administrators. Then we went all the way to May, which was wrapping up last year's um, calendar year, and we were able to put out an interest form, a survey, for anyone to be present to be part of this committee, um, willing to take part in piloting the program in the classroom and also offering input. So we included teachers from TK to sixth grade, parents representing these grades as well, if you had a child in that particular grade, administrators, coaches, district office specialist. There was site representation from each school, um, DLI, GATE, SDC, AEOA. We made sure that we had DLI at every single grade. We had three different online academy teachers apply and we took those on as well because we wanted to make sure that we were um, allowing an opportunity for their voices to be heard for teaching science in a virtual component, which is their reality. Um, and so the interest form went out and that left us with, I think, 66 people on our committee. So in July, we had three programs that we had uh, selected from the distance learning committee. And those three programs were Discovery Education, National Geographic Learning, and Twig Science. Um, it's important to note that Discovery Education Learning is different than the Discovery Education streaming video platform that we currently use in Anaheim. That is one that offers um, a different wealth of multimedia that we still use, um, but this was actually their science tech book. So it was a little bit of a shift in our mind to, um, to associate between the two, to differentiate between the two. So then that set us up for the work for our committee to do. Um, before we could look at any of the programs, we needed to step backwards and uh, engage in some professional development because teachers on the panel uh, ranked themselves in their comfort in teaching science. And we made sure to get a whole span of teachers who did not feel very comfortable in science all the way to those who um, who were able to say that they are experts in the field because we know that we have teachers in our district that will fit all of those ranges. So it was very important for us to uh, make sure that we were setting the field level for everybody to be able to engage in the professional development, everybody to be able to align our vision and what we're looking for in a curriculum for our students and um, set the criteria for us to be able to evaluate the curriculum. So that was in July and the very next day, we invited all three publishers, National Geographic Learning, Discovery Education, as well as Twig Science to present to the group. Using the information that we learned on the day before, we were able to evaluate the three programs and the committee was able to select two programs that they wanted to pilot. Now the uh, question to them was that if there were three that they wanted to pilot, we would have piloted all three. However, they felt strong enough that only two of them deemed the time um, that they wanted to give for the six weeks of piloting each program. So they chose to move on with Discovery Education as well as Twig Science. So from there, we received training on the Discovery Education platform and training was a little bit different and tricky this year because of the sub situation. We were able to train digitally and have ongoing support for the whole first week of instruction in whatever platform, so in this case, Discovery, and then ongoing support every Wednesday for the entire six weeks. After we taught Discovery Education for six weeks, we met to debrief it to explain and talk about what was working and what wasn't working, which allowed for teachers to go back and try any last minute um, new learning that maybe they didn't know about before moving on to TWIG. 
Then in October, we were able to train again virtually using TWIG because we wanted to make sure that we were keeping both programs similar in our approach in training our teachers so that it was consistent and fair. And after receiving training on TWIG, we again taught the program for six weeks, came back and met together to express the strengths and weaknesses of the um, curriculum. And then from there, had one more week before we made um, our last meeting, which was our consensus day in December, where we, where we talked about both programs. So in terms of our selection focus, what we were looking for in our initial screening was that um, the book that we selected is, was going to have the three dimensions of science. We wanted to make sure that phenomena was going to be present in the learning. That means local, and invest, uh, local phenomena for our students to have that are investigative and anchoring so that our students can see the wonders of the world that exist at a larger whole as well as on their campuses. So what you might see in the pictures that are in this presentation is a lot of learning outside of the classroom, but there is learning happening on our classroom, uh, playground, on our playgrounds. So it's important to see that our students are engaging in the world that they live in to see um, the local wonderings that they might have in their world. We wanted it to be coherent across the curriculum, building from year to year. Uh, we had a TK class learning about intestines and the body systems all the way up to traits that are inherited or dominant and recessive in sixth grade. And you'll see some of the language that the TKers are able to retain as far as you know intestines and esophagus and words like that. Whereas if our TKers can learn that, Imagine what they can do each year if they're able to build on that up to sixth grade. We wanted it to be relevant to the local community so that our students are looking at their world around them and asking questions, going back to that problem solving skills. And import, it was important for us to take into consideration the Fair Education Act, that our students are able to look at the programs and see scientists that look like them, to see that scientists don't always look a certain way. And the, I will say that the program that they recommended has a very, very diverse um, platform for students on their website and in their book, as well as teachers. After the initial screening, we looked to refine our focus where we were really diving through both curriculums to make sure that we had support for all learners in there, that phenomena was present, that we had the 5E model of instruction where inquiry was um, a high priority and engineering. Um, the idea of inquiry and asking questions usually peaks at age four for students. And that's a very interesting concept when you think about when students enter school is age four. And so they come into an environment where you're giving them more and more input with science and social studies and reading and math and all of a sudden they stop asking questions. So we wanna make sure that we're creating an environment and selecting a curriculum that really fosters the idea that inquiry is important and that students should be asking questions to continue their own lifelong learning. So what we were um, recommending is a program that has access for all, again, DLI in each grade level, that we have opportunities for gate and differentiation to accelerate a program if necessary. The online academy needs to have their needs met because we know that they learn in a very different way than the typical classroom does right now in the brick and mortar that our special education students are considered in whatever program is recommended, and that our emergent bilingual students are also getting their needs met through our recommended program. Uh, right there, you can see one of the activities that the TKers did with their body systems. And again, we're talking about that spiraling phenomena that if we're talking about body systems and how systems all work together, that they're learning about it in the TK level with maybe pictures and creating a um, graphic of a student all the way up into sixth grade where they're making Google slide presentations and they're talking about their own character traits and what their parents look like. Um, we also wanted it to connect with the other programs in AESD so that it's easy for teachers to align with benchmark or with um, the other content areas that they're already teaching to make sure that we're getting a holistic um, education for our students. What was important for us is that we selected a uh, curriculum that was able to meet the needs of the teachers. So again, when they ranked themselves from either novice all the way to expert, we wanted to make sure that teachers could take whatever book was given to them and get their needs met and not outgrow the program in two years. Because we know this adoption is going to be around for several years and we wanna make sure that everybody can be successful with what they have and still have room as professionals to grow. 
um, the program also, we wanted the ability for them to fast track and also have enrichment. And the programs are written because to be a state adopted curriculum, you need to have 185 days of science instruction to it. But we know that not everyone has time to teach science 185 days when there's not necessarily 185 days on the calendar. So that being said, being able to still teach every single standard with success and have students retain that information. And then again, um, opportunities for different approaches to instruction. We know teachers learn differently, students learn differently, and um, having a book that really taps into the UDL components of how our students can be successful and um, be engaged with their learning. Uh, the integrated approach, like I said, using our language arts standard, standards as well as our SMPs are going to be ingrained in it because the next generation science standards were written in such a way to infuse both of these other content areas in science. And we wanted our learning to be hands-on with whatever recommended program we have because we know that we learn by doing and students do as well. And lastly, to explore those careers and those job opportunities that they might not know exist and introducing them through that in this program that is recommended. So what I will say is that the programs that we were able to dive deeper into, uh, both were very strong in phenomena and asking students to look at their real world around them and ask questions about their learning and what they're seeing and how different components relate to one another in nature. They both were very strong in their disciplinary core ideas, which is the four domains of science that every single grade is responsible for teaching. They had components of cross-cutting concepts, which is basically how students are able to make connections between the facts of science that they need to memorize and the, what they do in order to um, make those discoveries. And then lastly, our engineering, because we know that engineering doesn't just happen at the end of a unit or at the end in isolation as a fun Friday activity. Engineering should serve as a purpose. And um, both of these programs did have elements where engineering is served as a purpose to solve a problem where students are able to go back and refine whatever they're creating along the way to show the new learning or new input that they've obtained in that day's um, instruction. So here's an example of what um, Discovery Education looked like. Again, um, it's important to understand that Discovery Education Techbook is not the same as the streaming service that we uh, use for the media. You'll see that they had uh, rich text opportunities. Um, there were opportunities for students to be able to use QR codes to jump to the pages in and type in the boxes. And the online platform um, was pretty easy for teachers to use. The next few slides will talk more about um, TWIG, which is the, direc the direction where I'm going with the next few slides. So you'll see that the setup is a little bit different. So the TWIG science book you'll see is kind of um, more aligned to how Benchmark is set up and it has the text um, in the middle, what you'll see is um, videos that are there. You'll see interactives where students are able to click and drag different components and move them in um, and around different scenarios. And again, these are all available in English and Spanish. And then it asks them to have opportunities to reflect and challenge um, their thinking to provide their explanations. So you'll see the setup's a little bit different between the two programs. Something I do want to highlight in the Twig Science program is that going back to that engineering component. So this is an example of a sixth grade module where you are presented as um, you're hired by a company that is in um, the engineering and the medical field. So on the left, you have your basically letter of congratulations. You've just been hired for this task. And you're presented as a sixth grade student with the task of creating a prosthetic hand for somebody who does not have one. Then you have a video of somebody who has a prosthetic hand and he talks about what the hand can do, what it can't do, what he wishes it could do. Beneath that, you'll see the task or the outline, the criteria of what you're trying to accomplish. It needs to be as strong as a regular hand. It needs to be able to do this. It needs to be able to grasp different objects. There are samples there for the teacher to see of what other people can do, but we don't show the students that because we want them to come up with their own. And they have a rubric where it shows the different elements of the engineering component where they can grade themselves and be graded on how well they are solving this particular task. And lastly, because we know we want everything to be relatable to what they're being assessed of, there's assessments built in that go back to that same prosthetic hand, which you can see right there at the bottom. So you can see in a quick glimpse here what maybe a month of instruction could lead to in a sixth grade classroom. 
so Twig Science, like I said, um, had different opportunities here. Some of the highlights that we got to see is that our third grade students worked with painted, butter painted lady butterflies and got to have those hatch in their classroom and um, they were able to uh, experience that. There was a lot of um, plant <laughs> growth and experiments happening. I know our fifth grade students were dealing with plants and creating situations where they would see if a plant would flourish or not with light or water, things like that. And our online academy siblings that were younger were very concerned that we were killing plants on, ac on purpose because we knew that certain situations might not yield plant growth. For example, water versus not water, uh, no, no water. So there were different opportunities for them to explore. Um, there were also earthworms in the kindergarten class, which was um, fun to see. And then we have a picture here of the online academy uh, who was dealing with lakes and uh, reservoirs there. So back to that December day, we were able to meet for our consensus day. Uh, we started the day um, with different table groups, almost in a breakout situation where we had topics uh, with personnel from the district office to help support. So for example, we had DLI as one of the tables, GATE, um, language arts connections, uh, access for all students, the technology pieces or assessments, and you got to go out and see those expert leaders and engage in conversations in areas that you might not have been able to explore to the depth that you wanted to and talk about it with other teachers from other grade levels. Um, because a lot of our discussions were set in your regular grade compartment, this gave you a vision as to what other grades experienced. Then we went a little bit deeper and we shifted to an instructional focus where we had um, grades levels mixed up and you were focusing merely on one of the categories of student-centered instruction, the 5E model, phenomena or engineering, and you got to hear how that component spiraled throughout the grade levels. And then lastly, we shared out as a grade level on the strengths and the weaknesses of each of the programs and had an open discussion. I will say again, going back to one of those hurdles that we had, we did have some teachers that were pulled because of sub shortages and um, they were not able to engage in the consensus conversation of the day, but they still were able to vote online. So they submitted their vote on a Google form and we were able to share out any words that they wanted the group to hear prior to the group voting so that their voice was heard as well. And then the outcome of the uh, vote was there that 97% of the committee was recommending that um, we move forward with Twig Science. And I'm gonna pass it back to Corey. And then we just wanna address how everything we did um, was in a, uh, addressing our LCAP goal of making sure that we're preparing our students uh, for our college and career opportunities. That was kind of a driving force for everything. Um, before we turn it over for any questions you might have, I want to take a moment to thank Megan for the very thorough job she did over the past year, um, really vetting the resources, working with the vendors, and taking our teachers on an amazing learning journey for the past year to really strengthen their science knowledge. She mentioned teachers came in with varying degrees of science knowledge, but I think it's fair to say most of the teachers, if not all of them on the committee, left um, this whole process much more um, equipped to teach science in their classroom. So thank you, Megan, for the thorough uh, process that you went through. So having said that, we're going to open up and see if the board has any questions for us. Board members, any questions? Yeah, first of all, great job. Very thorough. I really love how you uh, got the input from the, the teachers, uh, got the input from our various groups. I am curious about what, are the, what some of the current, uh, some of the concerns were that arose, uh, but more of my question is, uh, you know, whenever we're going through an instructional shift, I know, especially with NGSS, which is something that I 110% uh, agree with, that's great that we're moving away from the banking approach and moving more towards inquiry-based and, you know, solving relevant, you know, uh, issues within uh, within um, NGSS and you know close to our, our our community, right? Um, <coughs> uh, well, my first question is, uh, what ongoing supports will we have for some of our teachers? Um, I know that there will be some that will struggle, uh, some that will need continued supports, 
some that might be like, oh, I don't think this is the right way to the right move, but you know, it's the move that we're going as a nation, right? What ongoing supports will we have uh, uh, for those teachers? Yeah, excellent. So as we do with any um, textbook adoption, we of course will be providing training for our teachers. Um, so all of our teachers will receive a two-day training in the curriculum. Day one will be on the next generation science standards in the framework. Day two will be on the specific curriculum. Um, we're very fortunate that we have Megan, so Megan will be able to support the school sites throughout the next few years with that adoption. Um, and then we're also very fortunate that we have the digital learning coaches that support us with all of our STEAM and technology related matters. So whether training on the technology piece, they're also able to, and working with Megan, support our teachers with science. So they're actually able to go in and go through the co-teaching practice with our teachers. So it won't simply be come get the training, go back to your classroom, now what do you do? they'll have the digital learning coach there to support them as they go through what might be new or maybe a little bit nerve nerve wracking for them they'll have that support there as they go through it and board president i have one last question uh now that we're moving towards the ngss what does assessments look like how do we check for understanding within this new uh way of pedagogy, instruction, teaching, curriculum, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, with the recommended program that we have, there's a lot of ongoing um, assessments that you can see both formally and informally. What I will say is that the TWIG assessment pieces was done by scale with no um, review revisions necessary, and that's the same company that comes out and creates the Smarter Balanced Assessment. So everything there in their online component bank of assessments are also done in the same format that the students would take the CAST in. So CAST is the fifth grade assessment that students have to take in science, it's similar as the eighth grade one as well. So we have some ongoing assessments that students can do, whether it's engineering and you're able to see it and make those observational assessments. There's also the open-ended writing, written assessments that are there as well as the computer-based ones. Is it heavier on the writing or is it heavy, heavier in bubbling in? No, there's very little bubbling in. Okay, good. It's a lot of, um, actually it's very text rich where Got they it. have to read a scenario and reflect to what you would do based on this hypothetical experiment. And um, so it really does rely on students needing to do, get that hands-on component in the classroom to be able to replicate that in their mind and then answer it. Very little bubbles. <laughs> Any other questions from other board members? I have a few. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for uh, taking the time to invest in looking at all the different publishers. And I, I really do appreciate the inclusivity of different uh, uh, members of our community and our spaces our, and all, our, all of our teachers that kind of were included and all the staff members that took part in investing time to make sure we chose the right curriculum for our kids. Um, so uh, my first question is uh, related to, I see like some of the experiments require supplies and materials that are consumable. And so my question is, what's our plan for ensuring that teachers don't have to go out and buy a set of things every time they're teaching that lesson? And are we actually gonna be able to facilitate getting those things to A, all the teachers in our br uh, brick and mortar classrooms, but how do we facilitate our online academy to get those materials out to the homes? Yeah, so that's, um, that's a question we are very happy to answer because we're happy to say the adoption includes all consumables for the life of the adoption. So anything that's asked for in the curriculum will be provided by the adoption. If it's um, um, general materials that we have, we as a district will be providing that for our teachers. And in fact, it's funny that we asked our teachers at the very end of consensus day, what are some just last minute concerns you have about this particular curriculum? And they had no concerns about the curriculum. The first thing they shared was, how am I gonna get the spaghetti? How am I gonna get the marshmallows? How am I gonna get the cork? How am I gonna get the tongue depressors? Oh, and by the way, how am I gonna store it in my classroom? So we were sitting there furiously taking notes like, great question, great question. So we worked with the um, vendor uh, of the publisher. Um, so we will have all of those materials for our teachers. And then we're gonna work on making sure that it doesn't impact the classroom so much that teachers have, you know, eight years worth of materials sitting there so that, that we are very aware of that. That's great. That's the first thing I think of when I, uh, in the context of being the teacher, right? So <laughs> do the teachers have to buy stuff and then we don't want that to happen. So thank you making, for making sure that's something we're doing. And then uh, I'm just curious, um, about 2% of the, the group uh, voted no. Is there any insight on maybe some comments they made on why they, they chose, uh, they said no? Yeah, so um, that was actually one vote. 
And like I said, um, that person was pulled from the consensus day, so was not able to take part in the other grade levels discussions to hear what the positives were from the other grades. What I will say is, um, the particular person, because I have spoken with them, preferred the other curriculum over this one because of content alone. So for example, in the first pilot that they did, it was body systems and it was engaging and it was a sixth grade class who was able to talk about wonderings that they have in sixth grade. And then the second publisher, they talked about air masses. So air masses to a sixth grader isn't necessarily as interesting to learn about as opposed to body systems. So she was um, pulling her kids as to how engaged they were. So then I challenged her to look at the, if there was time instructionally, because I know we need to cover all the, the standards, to look at what it would look like to do the body systems from the second publisher and through that lens to see. I also challenged her to use the body systems assessment piece from the second pilot even though the content was from the first, just to see if the two al aligned and how it would compare, but that's really what it was. Thank you, I appreciate it. Any other comments or questions? You sure? Thank you so much for the presentation. We really, re really appreciate your work. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, item 7B, dual language emergent update uh, by Maria Vegas, Director of Curriculum and Instruction and Magali Rodriguez, Coordinator of Multilingual Language Instruction Programs. Welcome, thank you. Good evening, board members, President Alvarez, Superintendent Downing, cabinet members. Thank you so much for having us this evening. Um, it's always a pleasure to be able to come and provide a board update for you on our dual language academy. I'm being joined tonight by my fabulous team. I'm really grateful. So our coordinator of multi-language programs, Magali, and then also Lisette Sanchez, which is our dual language immersion TOSA. So we can put a face to that name as I'm sure you've seen her around town or we'll see more of her now that we have more in-person opportunities. So with that said, we'll get started. So the first thing we wanted to put just right on the forefront is where we're going in 22, 23. So this is a graph that kind of just shows, not kind of, it shows exactly where our growth is gonna be going into next year. And what you see right there, first and foremost, is 16 classrooms in third grade, one in fourth, one in fifth, and two in sixth. And just a couple of things to mention here. I mean, third grade kind of marks that 50%, where our students are 50% down the way of their DLI pathway here with us in Anaheim Elementary. So that's, that's a yay, that's a, su a success for sure. But it also um, lets us know that there's still a path to get to that full matriculation across our grade levels. And though we'll have two more schools, um, Ponderosa and Ross, who will be at full matriculation, again, another success, we've got to count those successes. That puts us at five schools, which is still only about 20% of our 23 schools. So wonderful, um, we're inching away. I still remember when we first presented and you guys, the, the, the board had great questions about how are we gonna, we're gonna have a vision and how are we gonna build it and how are we gonna ensure that it, we, we follow through on this commitment to our community. So that's just a little update there. And then I'm going to pass it over to Magali. All right, good evening, board, cabinet, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and keeping with um, our path that Maria laid out, it is just a reminder that that is, will be our continued path as we move forward for the next um, few years, four years. Uh, we will be adding 16 to, between 16 and 20 classrooms every school, every school year. So we continue to turn to our own talent within our ASD classrooms and recruiting and really um, see seeking who are our teachers who currently hold a bilingual authorization. So I'm gonna take you back to, um, most of you uh, are aware of the BECOME project that we had in partnership with Cal State Fullerton um, a couple years ago now, two or three years ago now. And so that was a very successful path that we embarked in. And so we turn now um, and with our partners at CS, uh, Cal State Fullerton, and asked to mirror one of the paths that we did with the BECOME project, which was looking at those teachers who hold a, either a BCLAD or a BASP, and that depends on when they got their bilingual authorization, they just call it different, but it's essentially the same thing. Um, so we really wanted to emphasize what are the teachers that have that bilingualism, amplify their bilingualism, because a lot of the teachers have the skill set, honestly, they're, they're afraid. 
they're afraid to take that jump. And I've said it before, that was myself. Um, I was, I had the skills, but I thought the fifth graders were gonna know more than I did. And so I was really hesitant. And so we really want to amplify that social competence. And at the end of the day is looking at that suit of achievement through the lens of our, of our educators teaching the, the target language or the partner language. And so we um, got to work, we created a path and we provided a um, information session. We, I personally invited each of those 40 teachers and asked them to join us in our information session. Um, and it was really just uh, informing them on what was to come. Okay, um, I don't think I mentioned it, but it was intended for us to also provide compensation to our teachers to, not, to form part of this uh, professional learning series as well. And so that was the intent, now here's the outcome. We had three teachers that attended the information session. Uh, we followed up with the survey, really again amplifying what, is, what it is, what we were looking to do, and it really that it was for them to continue to develop themselves. Even if like, let's say they decided that this year was not the right year for them to come into the dual language setting, it was still going to provide much needed inquiry into how to become just a better teacher who is meeting the needs of different diverse language needs within our classroom because they, they're everywhere, whether in the DLI setting or not. Um, so we had two teachers that once the survey was um, take, given, two teachers responded that they were interested in joining this professional learning series. But in revisiting our agreement with um, Cal State Fullerton, it, we really needed at least 15 teachers to really provide that cohort because we, it was important to us that it wasn't just a, a, a professional learning series that they were spoken to, but more so it was something that they could collaborate with, really build on what is their pedagogy, what is their own thinking in terms of um, bilingual education. Um, but with that, we didn't stop there, because I know they're talking to teachers, they're constantly, some of them just have questions that really have nothing to do with, let's say, um, how do I teach this particular item? But they really wanna know what is life like in a dual language setting? What does it really mean to teach dual language, right? They hear the myths, they hear, so they have a lot of questions. And so on February 3rd, um, we'll be providing an open Google Meet where teachers just can pop in and out and ask those questions, hear from us, uh, maybe squash some myths or maybe just you know, assure them of what goes on in a dual language classroom. So some of them are wanting to take that, they're possibly ready, so we're hoping that that'll give them that extra little nudge that they need to um, come on over, okay? So that's that with the... Okay, um, we continued this year with uh, the return of our DLI teacher collaborations, something that we have offered in the, in the past. And really what it is, is just a space for our dual language teachers to come together. We well, were well aware that it is at all 24 of our school sites. And so they do have the ability to team or team teach or prepare and plan with teachers at their own district or at their own school, sorry, but um, we want them to come together across the district with each other. And so we provide a space for them. It's not, we don't dictate an agenda. We don't tell them what it is that they need to do. It's just a space for them to come together. On December 1st, we had our first one where we had 46 out of the 121 teachers participate. And just this last week, on January 19th, we held our second one. And you will note there that only six teachers were present out of the 121 teachers. Uh, so we have to pivot. It's no secret. Times have been, you know, interesting lately. And so we are pivoting now for the April 20th, and we're going to provide our first ever virtual collaboration. So wish us luck. <laughs> we're trying to figure out breakout rooms in a way that we want the collaboration to be meaningful and for them to actually um, walk away with something from the time that they're with us. So that's um, to come. So I'm hoping that those numbers will be, more people will be prone to check in from their classroom or at home um, in order to collaborate. Okay, so we're talking about teacher support and I'm very proud and excited to introduce Lisette Sanchez. She is our DLI TOSA. Good evening, board members and cabinet. Again, my name is Lisette Sanchez. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I've been an educator for over 20 years. Uh, the last 10 years were in a dual language setting and I had the opportunity to work both in primary and upper grade as a dual language teacher. Uh, my last two years, um, I was a curriculum coach at Lincoln Elementary and I was happy that I was able to work both with English teachers and dual language teachers and the community and parents there at Lincoln. Uh, one of my primary goals is to focus this year on our new DLI teachers. So I sent out a survey um, that went out to all of them, just asking them 
their areas of interest. Where did they need support? Was it SLD, math, language arts, intervention, um, navigating our uh, platforms like iStation uh, or Vista Higher Learning? And I also work with coaches a lot on navigating the ins and outs of dual language. I want to make sure that they're comfortable supporting their teachers. Um, I also do direct support with navigating our platforms of iStation and VHL. VHL. We do data analysis with the teachers. We um, work on differentiation for their students, planning small group instruction, and planning next steps. With the teachers, I also model lessons. I work with them on planning, on navigating the curriculum. I try to really make myself available, ready av available to them, whether they want to meet virtually or in person. I also help um, create support materials for our program and for our teachers. And another item that I do is I support school sites with parent meetings and helping the parents feel more comfortable of how they can at home support their dual language um, students. So that's a little bit of what I do, and I'm excited um, to be here and continuing to support the dual language program and our teachers and our community. Thank you. Great, right, thank you, Lisette. And I just want to add that we are the only district to offer a DLI TOSA. So we really have <laughs> put you know, our focus in ensuring that the program is growing, the teachers are feeling supported. Okay, so uh, most of you guys are familiar with ELD, English Language Development. Some of us go back, way back and think of like S, uh, ESL. We always have the English in front of most of the work that we do. But here I want to um, challenge you to folk er, elevate your thinking in terms of language development and really look at language development with English in the front, Korean in the front, and Spanish in the front because we are a district that is in fact developing all three languages within our, our classrooms. And so language development just means exactly that. We are looking at our language and how it functions and how it works. So I'm gonna narrow in a little bit on our um, Korean language development and our Spanish language development because it's very different to teach in a language, right? We teach in Spanish or we teach in Korean or we teach in English, but it's very different when you're teaching Spanish or teaching Korean or teaching, right? So it's, it's little difference in syntax there, but it really is a huge impact that it makes for our students and when you're teaching the structures of the language and how the language functions. And so it has been mandated for us if a student is an emergent bilingual that they need to receive English language development. But not, the state did not mandate us to teach our Spanish learners or our Korean learners the function of Spanish or the, the function of Korean. And so we took it upon ourselves to do such that because we, we promised our parents that our students would be biliterate at the end of sixth grade and the only way to do that is to thoroughly teach the structures of the language. And so began our Spanish language development, our Korean language development. So the way that it would work prior to three years ago is that if you were an emergent bilingual, you must receive English um, language development. And if you were an English only student, then you would receive either Spanish language development or Korean language development. But we quickly, as we're constantly analyzing our data, we were noticing that our students, even though let's say they had Spanish in the home or Korean in the home, they weren't completely proficient. And so what we did, we then brought in a, a second block of time where students are receiving a block of time specifically for English language development and a block of time specifically for a Spanish language development and Korean. So now essentially they're receiving both structures in kinder, first and second grade because they need it in order to fully develop and acquire their language. So our teachers have been doing that. However, it wasn't reflected in their report card and it wasn't reflective in our assessment calendar. And so we brought it to the Emergent Bilingual Council. Our recommendation was that since it was already happening in the classroom, that we actually made it formal by adding it to the assessment calendar and, and uh, essentially to the report card so the teachers could have that conversation. And it was overwhelmingly welcomed because um, I, I'm gonna quote a teacher within the council. She said, it's a soft change. We've already been doing it. I'm already tracking it. It's just a matter of adding it. So I wanna be clear that it's not adding any extra work to our educators. It's just a way to formalize it and now ensuring that it is apparent and obvious. It doesn't matter if a student is an EO or an EB, they're receiving structures of the language and are learning it and now it's reflective in their report card. Okay, Spanish reclassification, now staying within the theme of 
the only thing that we do in Anaheim. So we are the only district that acknowledges reclassification of Spanish. It is mandated by the state that our students um, who are emergent bilinguals are reclassified as English proficient. Nobody's mandating that our students are Spanish reclassified except for us. We are that, again, honoring the parallel of both languages equally, um, whether it be Spanish. We happen to be talking about Spanish. Korean is also in the works. And so a few years ago, we began the criteria for reclassifying students starting as early as third grade. And we have been um, providing that. We have certificates for the families, again, empowering parents and students to continue on that bilingual path. And this year, we included in our LCAP goal, goal number two, which is to increase Spanish reclassification for DLI students by 5% annually. As of January 10th, we already have 104, student candid 104 candidates, students on deck, ready to be Spanish reclassified. That's as of January 10th, but I venture to say that the numbers keep increasing. So we're really proud to, to show that our students are not only reclassifying as Spanish proficient and also as English proficient and soon to come as we matriculate to Korean, Korean proficient as well. So very proud of that. All right, our last couple of slides. So <clears throat> with all that wonderful work, goal number one is enrollment in order to, for them to access what we're really proud of, high quality curriculum, high quality um, programs. Um, so of course, um, to keep a strong trajectory for our DLI enrollment is job number one for, our, our, for us as a district, for our principals. So we've uh, started with, um, of course, the district support of our formal DLI parent information meetings that we've always had historically. We, do, we have four slated. They're gonna be starting in February, going through the end of March with the virtual option there for our families as well. But of course we know that's not enough and what our families really respond to is to our principals to bringing the information to school sites so um, paired with this is of course what our principals are charged with which is having weekly enrollment meetings so we did uh, prepare our principals to be able to be the champions of this program at their school sites in those conversations in the parking lot at dismissal because that's where it all kind of happens for our families um, to have a presentation, and in that enrollment presentation, it includes DLI information so that they can walk their parents through that and they're, they're bringing that opportunity for our families. Um, and then, then our final slide here, our final couple of slides, kind of lead us to a conversation that we started with you when we presented in September about just talking about the gift of language and other languages. And prior to the pandemic, uh, we had started this conversation with our Emergent Bilingual Council, started talking about, hey, let's look at our language census, let's look at um, top languages in the world and so forth, let's exploratory. And at that time, there was some recommendations of, well, let, perhaps Mandarin was rising to, to the top there. But you know what we see on paper sometimes, and you know the numbers and what research says, it's not necessarily what's serving best our community as we we always strive to do. So where we picked that up this year is we put together a survey and we reached out to our families, to our preschool families specifically. We have about 850 preschool families enrolled currently, and we were really pleased to see the response. Um, it's about 50% response. So we provided a survey. We wanted to build awareness of the academy and then gauge that, com that community interest in other languages and the languages that included. But I'm, I'm going to actually show you some of the slides. Uh, so, um, wow. I, I, so this first question, uh, it just asked, I'm probably going to, I can't read that here. I probably have it here that far. Is where, Would they be interested in, uh, here, I'm going to look back here. In, um, yes, do you plan to send your child Number one, do you plan to send your child to Anaheim Elementary or into a TK or kindergarten classroom? And wonderful, 90, what, 3%? 96% said yes. So we're happy to hear that. So out of our 372 respondent, re responses. So the second question there that we asked them, it was just about three to four questions. We want to keep it short and simple and not complicate things for our families. Um, would you be interested in, in, in enrolling in a dual language program? So fantastic, again, in the 90s, 95% of course are saying yes, we're interested in a dual language program and what that can offer for my child. Fantastic. We took one step further and then said, 
out of these languages, you know, what would you gravitate towards? What would be your interest? And as you can see there, I think number one, it's very validating and affirming that providing um, Spanish as a dual language immersion aligns with what our community is asking for and what they will continue, hopefully, to, to ask for as we make it accessible and available at all our schools and continue to build that program all the way fully through. But secondary there, you see um, a couple of different percentages, but the second one rising to the top is Mandarin. So again, it kind of aligned um, what we started researching, what we um, understand might be the best direction, but knowing that we hear it directly from our families, I think is you know, work that we're always proud of to <coughs> really know it is reflective of, of something that the community wants. And I think we circled it for you. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and then finally, just a wonderful quote that we try to always, you know, dual language is just another pathway to be able to see the world from a very diverse perspective and um, something that we think is of value as our children become global, globally ready to uh, be successful in the future. So that's our presentation for you this evening. Our team is here to answer any questions that you may have. From members, any questions? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, very informative. I had three questions for you. The first one um, regarding the, the previous slide that you just, not the quote one, the one right before that with the percentages. Um, oh, and I would defer to President Alvarez on this, but the percentages don't add up to 100. So I'm wondering, did, were the responses on here, were there multiple responses? Um, as far as the number of responses, 356, I, I it looks like more people responded, 356. We had a total of 372, so we might have taken this snapshot um, prior to some final responses. We, we set the, the survey to go between January 10th, I believe, to the 21st, so we might have sneaked in a, a, a snapshot of that survey prior to the final, because, of course, the more the merrier, because it, it's a little more. Thank you for catching that, though. Of course, yeah. Uh, the second question is a two-part question. Uh, the first part is on the surveys that were sent out. Um, there's 121 teachers, DLI. Um, what percentage of teachers responded to the surveys? Great question. Do we know? To, to the teacher survey now, right? To the teacher survey. We had 10 teachers respond. Are 10 we talking teachers. about the 121 current teachers? Are we talking about the 40 teachers? Uh, the, with the B clad? Just for the survey that you sent out, because you mentioned yeah, in so that, that was a 40, yeah. So it was 40 teachers um, who hold, so HR was so courteous in working with us, we read the list of who has the bilingual authorization. It was 40 teachers total. Out of those 40, three attended the information session, and our response to that was to send out not only the presentation, information, facts about the program, followed by the survey. And the survey was very clear. It asked, would you want to participate in this uh, learning series? And then secondly, the question we asked was, are you interested in teaching in a DLI classroom? And out of those, only two responded to the survey. Okay. That, that they, were, that they oh. were on board, and it was 10 responses. I'm sorry, and I was also more referring to the survey um, that was sent out for support. I think it was slide. Yeah, that collaboration. Eight. Yeah, that one regarding, because it said possible areas of support, SLD, math, language, arts, intervention, all of those things. So how many teachers received that survey and how many responded back? That survey was sent specifically to the new DLI teachers. Okay. Um, and I want to say that it was required for all of them to respond. Okay, so they all responded. Yeah. So um, she has um, been able to meet with every DLI teacher, brand new teacher, if not even just touch base virtually. So that was a goal that was set out and she was able to reach out. Okay. Only because we check in on a weekly basis, I can answer for her. Okay. <laughs> um, I was gonna ask what, the second part of my question was, what were the major areas of support that were needed so we as a board are aware and we can help you provide that support? A lot of the work that they've been asking for, um, a lot of it is stuff, not specifically for DI, but it's as new teacher stuff. Language arts, navigating the curriculum, um, and yeah. intervention, small group instruction, and uh, SLD and navigating. They're new to all the platforms, iStation, VHL, so a lot of it, I'm um, also supporting the coaches so they could be comfortable with those platforms and then they can, um, again, support their teachers at their sites. But I'd say the main thing is like language arts, 
writing and intervention, and then the DLI platforms, iStation and VHL. Okay, so it sounds like it's more of just a general new teacher, not necessarily specifically that it's a DLI teacher. I think the, the, the components of um, a lot of it is the strategies. They get hung up on, they're not understanding me, and then so I'm sharing with them, how do we scaffold? How do we model? How do we act it out? Because I don't, we want to stay true to the model and for them to stay uh, Spanish and not go to the other language. And so I'm trying to give them strategies and ideas of how they can get that language across to their students and using those scaffolds and pictorials and chants and then finding them, showing them the opportunities, how to elicit and have the, the children have more strategies and opportunities to practice that language with them. Okay, and that dovetails really into my third question, which was the coaching aspect. So it sounds like that the same issues, the same concerns that have been addressed. So, yeah. all right, well, thank you. That concludes my questions. I wanna thank you again for all the hard work and your team putting this together because that's a lot of offering of resources and you're making yourself available yeah. whether or not because of a variety of issues we're unable to connect with everybody all the time covid um, family issues there's a lot of stuff that comes up and uh, we saw that in the january 19th meeting yeah. but i appreciate that you're still putting those opportunities out there for yeah, our staff, and, I, so. and i'm constantly checking in on them and then also with like today i saw like administrators and you know it's just like Oh, they saw me and they're like, okay, I'm gonna reach out. Like, I need your, I need your help. So it's exciting to see that, um, you know, I, they, they know me, they know my, my work, and they know how I can support their teachers. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, first of all, great work. Every time you come here pr and present, always impressed uh, amidst what's happening right now in this worldwide pandemic. So I continue to give you kudos. Uh, I do have a few questions and some concerns. Um, first of all, with regards to parents, I, everywhere you go, like my friends and their kids, when they're going into preschool, when they're going into any of our sites, they're always commending our DLI program. In fact, at one of our fundraisers, I had a parent tell me that they're not even, they were supposed to move to Westminster, but because we have such an amazing DLI program, they're gonna stay in Anaheim. I'm not at all worried about our engagement because it's in the air. Families are talking about it. Uh, I personally went to a few of our uh, principal meetings with regards to the DLI pr programs are awesome. However you're doing it virtually, I'm sure it's gonna be amazing as well. So in that area, y'all are doing, you're continuing to do great. My concern is that every year, you know, we're gonna be adding more, more classes. My, my concern is the teachers. You said that there was 40 teachers who are credentialed, uh, who have BCLADs in our district right now, uh, who can, yet only three showed up and two committed. We need a total of 15 to have a cohort partnership with Cal State Fullerton, starting when? For this spring semester? which started this week. They were somewhat flexible. You know, they had to work these sessions into their regular classes as okay. a college professor. Uh, the other thing, remember, those are just the teachers that um, have an authorization. Have an Part two, yeah. we're also working with them to set up a cohort of AESD uh -huh. teachers that might be bilingual, but never okay. reached out or never set out to get their authorization. So that's gonna come up summer, I think I read, yeah. Summer. Okay. So we are planning to reach out to that group, but this was like a quick way okay. at this time of year to support people who you know might be like, oh, I don't know about, I, I have that authorization, I never used it, yeah. and but we wanted to help them with that confidence level. Okay. And I know it's a difficult time for teachers. Right now in our nation's history, we have probably, we have a huge demand for teachers, right? Um, our teachers are tired, right? So I get it. Um, but also I know, because now I work at the Cal States and one of our big shifts is uh, doing uh, bilingual authorizations. I just saw on social media when I was driving to work because it, you know, gets my whatever and social media that they're doing DLI and Montebello Unified. You know, in the end of the day, districts are not trying to catch up to us. But then they're, 
they're, they're going to be pulling their teachers, right? So now it's going to be a competition with regards to the demand of teachers. So that is my, my, my concern as we continue to have the program is, you know what I mean? And that's the one thing I'm going to watch. I, I really want to have continued, uh, you know, try, what, what else are we doing to, in, to, to entice our teachers to become part of the Become program? Do they have to pay? Yes, as you authorized, um, our wonderful negotiations team also offered a stipend to the particular teachers that we reached out to. So the first time we surveyed the teachers that have the authorization, it was, hey, come join us. We're going to pay you to take these classes, and you'll be prepared to go into a DLI class. Well, since that first survey went out, we signed the MOU with AEA yep. that that particular group of teachers would then be eligible for a stipend, a two-part stipend. So then we resent, we, we added that language to the survey and resent it out. And that's when we still got the two. And it could be right now. It's the times. What's going on in the classrooms yeah. and in everybody's lives. So um, as we get closer and closer to staffing, uh, we worked to present we put some information together for our, our principals to start having conversations with their staff. Like, it shouldn't be surprised what, uh, what classes we will or will not have next year. Let's have conversations, let's collaborate, let's work on that. So should the interest come back, we'll work with uh, Dr. Fernando and to see if he can you know, fit us into his teaching schedule to offer it because I think they, once things settle down again, people will be able to you know, put their cognitive attention to that and not just the day-to-day, -day, Okay. if that makes sense. No, definitely. Thank you so much, and great presentation always. Um, to just basically more or less kind of repeat all the kudos to you all for uh, the fantastic presentation that my other board members uh, provided you with already. Uh, Great job. Uh, the presentation was great. Um, it was lively and very, very thorough. Um, with that said, I'm going to kind of piggyback off of what Dr. McCullis was talking about a little bit. Um, and it just made me just think um, in regards to certain things. Um, and Dr. Grace touched upon something um, that I just want to kind of just get a little bit more clarity. If you are in this district and you're teaching in the dual language program, do you get a month, a yearly stipend for that? No. Okay. Um, I really think that this is something that negotiations should be looking at. Um, I would hope that their uh, group of, um, you know, bargaining unit would basically look at that because of the fact that this is in a demand. And if you're going to be asking people to do a shift like this, um, they need to be compensated. That's just fair. Okay. Um, with that said, since we can't really control that part uh, per se, um, Let's focus on what we can control, which is like, for example, our own professional development here in this district. So these dates that we have listed here, December 1st, January 19th, April 20th, obviously everything dropped pretty substantially. 46 out of 121, 6 out of 121, and then to be decided on April 20th. That number that's listed there, 121, I'm assuming that that's all the teachers who are teaching in the dual language program, correct? Yeah, the teacher collaborations are offering to everybody who's already in the program. Okay, Correct. so I looked at basically like on these dates and what's happening and whatnot, and I see that these are the early release dates, right? How did we incentivize them to come together besides providing them with a safe space, et cetera? They are compensated um, financially. They are come. compensated I, I, financially? I'm pretty sure I missed that point. They are compensated for their time. Okay, so it's after school taking place? Is that yeah, correct? It's, it's right after school. And we did talk, so before the beginning of the school year, we come together for a, uh, an entire day of planning. Perfect. Uh, we call that was it year long planning question. where they all could, we also pay them for that. And we asked them what days work better. They all landed on Wednesdays. They wanted Wednesdays after their um, contracted hour of planning at school. They said, we're already in planning mode. We want to just come. Um, and just come right into planning as a collaborative team once we leave our school. So these are all Wednesday dates, which that's who um, uh, overwhelmingly they all are like, yeah, let's do Wednesdays. Okay, 
Can you back up for one second, Magali? Because you said in the beginning of the school year, you have mm -hmm. them all come together and we compensate them. Is that during the days that they're supposed to be here? There, it's them? a summer day. It's a summer day. So they, it's about four or five days before. And again, that's what they thought it was better to be closer to the school year. Uh -huh. So they're starting to gear up, getting their classrooms ready and so forth. So they come together for an entire day. And that is hands down their favorite day because they get to still come in their summer attire casually and get ready and plan and they get paid to, to plan and get ready for the entire year. We're here to provide resources, answer questions, um, get them going with whatever they need to start off the year. Great. And do we provide any time in those prep days for just meeting with the dual language teachers for them to come together during that time when they can be prepping for their classes and other stuff to give them that opportunity? Are you talking about the prep days that are part of the calendar? That's correct. That's correct. No, because that is part of that is their time. There are specific things that the association bargains um, to be done on those prep days. So we can't tell them that they have to do come together to do that. They can if they want, but there are specific things that those two prep days from this year were um, marked for. And anything in regards to those prep days is anything earmarked when it comes to the whole issue of curriculum development? not on those prep days. The prep days are more to get their classrooms Just ready. Just classrooms. Um, staff meetings and um, required notifications type of things, paperwork, getting those things ready. But those are specifically prep for prepping for the school year. Okay. And then the last thing I just want to say is that um, I think it is awesome that we're putting a lot of focus on our dual language program. You know, I believe in it, et cetera. Um, but I would like for us to see in addition to, you know, the, the compensation that we give them in the summertime, um, I'm bummed to hear that, you know, obviously they don't get a stipend for, you know, participating in this. Um, but um, to just really carve out some time within our calendar days. I mean, if we're basically taking time tonight, talking about the dual language program, we all see its benefits, et cetera, then we need to adjust some things here in our district in order to make some more time um, and more space and more built into their regular professional development, whatever that may look like. Um, for them to service our students and plan together and really unite together. That's my humble opinion. But um, overall, I think it's great and I think it's awesome that we're continuing to grow. Um, and I just really hope um, we're just not talking about the yeah, dual language is great, 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 but we're actually putting our money where our mouth is and investing in this, so. Since you're talking about compensation, I would also uh, just inquire uh, about our leadership's uh, compensation as well because I know they go above and beyond. So maybe an email or just a Friday memo with regards to uh, comparables between directors and uh, here at the district office. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you so much. You guys are always just great. Um, and actually, Mr. Lopez asked the exact question that I was going to ask regarding the TOSA page and the survey, um, you know, what the response was in that. So I'll just kind of piggyback on that a little and just out of curiosity and you might not remember this or, or know this but when you're to get that information that you were looking for do you recall how the question or questions were framed was it just simple like what areas of support do you need or was it a little more in depth I'm just curious about how you framed the survey question and what so it was it asked them um, what areas and then we deal in like for example here we abbreviated VHL but VHL was very well out um, it's Vista Higher Learning, but it's really focused on Descubre Education and Yabisi. Descubre is actually focusing from kindergarten through fifth grade Spanish language development, and it goes from level A through F. And then we hone down on whether it was assessments that you were looking at, are you looking at instruction, are you looking at grouping? And then we went into sixth grade YBC and we did the same thing. So we definitely shortened the version here. We didn't want to talk forever, but it did go thoroughly into that. And then once we once we found, and I'm still working with the teachers a lot, they know me, I'm still readily available. Um, a lot of the times they don't even know what they really need until you're there. It's like, oh yeah, VHL, but once you're actually there, oh, you needed Estrellita, which is very specific to DLI and um, developing the phonics within the kinder system. So I was trying not to over speak, but that's really how pared down we have um, in terms of coming when we come out and support the teachers. Okay, thank you, great presentation. Sorry, I'm, Miguel, I was I'm, just gonna I'm sorry, add. I just oh. have one more, I'm, I'm so good. I was just going to add that um, to that point about in real time, kind of when you, when you work right there with them is where kind of people know what they need. Um, and that's why we've been working strongly with also our curriculum coaches, where it's DLI, you're coaching DLI, you're being available for DLI, you're, you're, you're there to support and be an expert, not just Lisette 
or Magali. I mean, it takes more. It has to be part of the school community. So um, that's another um, area that we're leveraging and very deliberately ensuring that our site curriculum coaches that are there to support in real time, in real practice, areas of instruction and curriculum are being used and have a clear understanding that that's their charge to support our dual language teachers because sometimes it becomes about, well, I don't speak Spanish. Okay, this is not about language that specifically that we're talking about in order to provide coaching support and we're able to bridge that. So I just wanted to highlight that. No, and in, in, in your presentation, actually what um, Trusty Philbeck was talking about, it, it sparked something in my mind that I was thinking about when I was talking about other ways that we can think creatively in order to basically continue these opportunities. And I guess this question would probably be for Dr. Grace in the sense of what are our parameters in regards to our after school programs or the expanded language opportunities programs? Can we do fun stuff with them in Spanish? Can we do like, can we do, think outside the box and hit on this socio-cultural competencies in regards to certain things? And if so, are we and where and what will that look like? So uh, Dr. Moreno is doing a wonderful job of garnering every resource available um, to offer in our expanded learning programs. We are, <clears throat> we are providing where we have the staff in the after school programs, um, tutoring or just language clubs. But specifically at Juarez, we have um, the debate club. The, I don't know if you're familiar with the gentleman. He used to work in Santa Ana, but he won runs these amazing student debate clubs. The, and we have him working at Juarez um, with the dual language students. Uh, we also um, have continued with our um, relationship with Ritmo and Mariachi at um, our legacy dual language schools. <coughs> We're looking to add more Mariachi, um, but it's hard with COVID to add Mariachi, which uses wind instruments and pl a place to play and authentic opportunity. So um, everything's queued up to go and Every school that I'm aware of offered um, their teachers the opportunity to do be creative. Um, when you look at some of those news reports, a lot of the creativity in our after school expanded learning is coming from the staff and their interests. I just want to add, we also have Valle Folklorico starting at 11 of our schools. So uh, we will continue to reach out to our teaching staff to participate. Um, the other piece I would say is the timing of the January meeting, um, given the surge, um, I would hope that that would be taken into consideration as to what was going on in the world. So understandably, we think it was a low number. Uh, conditions are improving and we look forward to more participation. Great, so there is basically really no kind of parameters in regards to the things we can continue to support them in whatever way. That was like my original question. Yes, definitely. Okay. And sure. just in terms of the ELO funding, uh, there's also opportunities throughout the day mm. to have interventions. Uh, as part of our feedback process, one of the things that the parents asked for was more support for our DLI students. So we continue to add components to ELO. Uh, we'll give a an update at our February 9th meeting about some of the newer things that are being added and what we're efforting to add as well. Great. But thank you for that input and feedback. Yeah, I yeah, no, I, I just think that, I think that we need to think as creatively as possible in regards to supporting such an awesome program um, and just think outside the box here. And so that's like just kind of why I wanted to know what were the specific parameters in this? I knew that we had some flexibility, but was there something that said like it has to be in English only? You know what I mean? Like in, in, in that sense. So thank you. Any, any other comment? I just have one last comment. Go for it. No, for please. It. I, we, I feel like it's okay. I'm good. The whole, I mean, <laughs> I, I, we, I know we ask a lot about DLI. Uh, and every time you present, we always come with tons of questions. Just know it, it's because we really are, are we're watching this program. It is. Uh, as a vision, as a board, as a district, you know, something that we just really watch and, and just know that it's, it's not to just, you know, make sure, all the, well, it is to make sure all the T's and I's are, are, are across, but uh, know that we value you so much 
and uh, uh, I know it's a lot to come to the board and you know ask answer all these questions, especially during a time of pandemic. But again, I I, I really mean it when I say that I really value both of you, or all three of you, or the whole program <laughs> in, in our cabinet. So know that, okay? Uh, thank you so much for all your hard work, especially during this time. I really value. Thank you. Um, just to kind of add, uh, Ryan, uh, our board member Varelis, my son, uh, is in currently enrolled in a extended learning opportunity at Horace Mann with the dual language teachers over there. So yeah, they're already doing it. I think it's just a matter of identifying where it's happening. It's fun activities, it's STEAM, it's cool stuff that started this week. So it's happening. We're doing it. So just address that. And then um, I just want to I just want to make sure you understand. It's very clear that you all are listening to what we're asking. So as we have been going through the process of developing the program and everything that we've asked of you all on the team with regards to how to develop it, what to look for, how to support teachers, all our concerns are being addressed. And it's, it's very obvious to us, especially to me, I think. Um, and it's really heartwarming that I know you're all invested in this work too. So, you know, it's not just like you're, you're just doing this job because you were placed in, in a position. You're doing it because you also have a passion for what you're doing. You have a passion for the educators involved. You're, you're bringing that work to them and experiences of your own life to them. And it is really important and appreciated. And we, and we, do, we do notice. So just know, you know, it's, uh, we understand it's stressful. And it's hard, <laughs> you know, right, Mr. President? It's hard. Yeah, it's right? hard work. As and a nation as a whole, not everyone's on board with DLI. Yeah. Yet the research only suggests that it only <laughs> strengthens our students' academic performances. Exactly. So thank you. Yeah, right. and then you also, you also have like the weight, the weight of and pressure of we are on the forefront of all the things that you're innovating with, right? This is a team of inno innovators. And so I know you're carrying some of that weight too and pressure. So just know like we're here for you. <laughs> We, we're here to support anything you need, and that's that's what it's about, right? Finding a team that is here to create positive outcomes for our families, and that's literally what we're doing. So I do appreciate your work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And honestly, we 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 know the commitment from our cabinet and our board, and truly, as all dual language teachers, we 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 think about this program at night. You know, like because there's a commitment to families and parents. We made a promise to them that we were going to have this pathway and um, it is part of our passion, but we know we couldn't do it without the support across the board and the things, you know, how we're being creative with teachers and HR and comp we're, we're open and, you know, we're looking for new answers to maybe questions that haven't been asked. We're, we're, we're listening. So thank you for recognizing that and knowing that it's our number one priority. So thank you on behalf of our team. Okay, at this moment we need to get a short break so we can set up for the next presenter, maybe five minutes. You think that's good? Five minutes, five minute break.
Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to item 7D. Um, I'm sorry, 7C, the AESD Adjustment of Trustee Area Boundaries Update. Um, welcome to the Anaheim Elementary School District's public hearing to receive input from the public and board members regarding the adjustment of trustee area boundaries for the 2022 election. The purpose of today's public hearing is to provide the community with information regarding Education Code Section 50195 requirement, sorry, point five's requirement to adjust trustee area boundaries after each federal census if the trustee areas vary in population by 10% or more. Due to significant population growth in parts of the district, the current trustee areas vary more than 10, per 10 in population and must be adjusted. The district's demog demographer will provide us with a short PowerPoint presentation on the legal requirements for adjusting trustee area boundaries and the demographics of the school district when trustee areas vary more than 10% in the population. The public and the board members may then provide input. After the public hearing is complete, the board will consider public input and discuss the maps that have been proposed. At the board's next meeting on February 9th, 2022, the board will consider the adoption of a resolution that chooses a map that makes adjustments to the trustee area boundaries. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to the podium to our demographer to provide us with the additional information followed by public input and board discussion. Thank you. Uh, evening members of the board and executive cabinet. My name is Angela Banuelos uh, from Cooperative Strategies. I'm the demographer assisting you with the 2020 redistricting process. So at our previous board meeting, we talked about the comparisons of the 2010 data and the 2020 data. And today we're gonna provide a summary of that and then present the three conceptual scenarios that have been presented at uh, community input meetings. So a recap of uh, what happened within the last 10 years. So in the last 10 years, the overall population grew by 3.1% uh, for a total of 6,051 new inhabitants. So that means that it's, it's everyone who lives in the district. It, it's children, senior citizens, uh, uh, citizens, non-citizens, voters, non-voters. So just anyone who lives in the district. Um, so we saw notable changes in areas um, one um, with 336% and area two with 155 um, population change, I'm sorry, I said percent. Uh, trustee area three had a negative 576%. Trustee area four had an actual increase of overall 15.4% at uh, 6,101 new inhabitants. And uh, trustee area five had just a decrease of 0.1% uh, by 35 inhabitants. So overall, uh, the 2010 census, uh, the current variance was 4.7% within the current trustee areas. However, compared to the 2020 census data, the district's variance is 8 per 18%. So it's 8% above the allowable 10% threshold. So here we provide uh, the uh, breakdown of the district's demographics of the 2020 census data. As we can see within the district, the total population is 202,659 um, inhabitants. So again, this means anyone who lives within the district boundaries. Uh, we utilize this data of the total population to help us identify how many people live there and to equally divide or nearly equally divide the area with, uh, with the correct amount of inhabitants and provide the variance below the 10%. So here with the demographics, we have noted that the largest protected class is the Hispanic Latino community, followed by the Asian community at 15.1%. Additionally, we provided information for the citizen voting age population, also known as CVAP. And what this actually tells us is where these communities of interest live to help us identify them and not impair their ability to elect a candidate of their choice. Uh, we provided a color graduated map of the largest protected class voters, which are the Hispanic Latino community. And if you can see on the map, the darker the area is, the more dense, the lighter the area, the less dense it is. And here we can see that a difference in, in actual voters, these are eligible voters, um, it's 106,953, so a very big, it's about 50%, right, from the total population. 
So about 48% of the Hispanic Latino are eligible voters and followed by the second largest protected class for the Asian community at 18%. Uh, here we have a graphic showing the current trustee areas. Uh, within all scenarios, trustee area number one will remain yellow. Trustee area two would be green. Trustee area three is going to be the pink coral color. Trustee area four is the blue. And trustee area five is the purple. Here we provided a breakdown of demographics of the current trustee areas compared to the 2020 census data. So um, if I can bring your attention to the top bar where uh, we'll discuss what variance means. So the total pop population again is 202,659 uh, and the ideal trustee area size, that means what number we're shooting for per area is 40,532. So that number is just the total population divided by five. Um, and then here we have the variance at 18%. So the variance is calculated by taking the most populated area and getting the difference with the least populated area and dividing that by the ideal trustee area size, giving us the variance. And then, um, so what are considerations knowing that we need to redistrict? Well, the first two are the most important it's each area shall contain nearly equal amount of inhabitants. So going back to the total population and distributing that amongst each trustee area equally or nearly equally. Uh, we have to draw and comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act. So that means no cracking or packing or in other words, gerrymandering. Uh, we have to keep the areas compact and contiguous as much as possible. Uh, we can't take some certain, we can take from one area on the east side and then another area on the west side to make one area. We have to keep those concise. Uh, we respect communities of interest as much as possible. Uh, follow man-made and natural geographic features such as main roads, highways, uh, mountain areas, anything that can be natural dividers so voters can understand where the boundaries are. Uh, we respect incumbency if possible. Um, and then other local considerations that may arise during this process. So I'm just curious, is having like, just out of curiosity, like sure. amongst all of the trustees having the, an equal amount of the school sites, that's not really, is that a really consi a consideration? Um, it, it can, if you bring it up, then that may be a consideration, but we have to comply first with the balancing the population. Ah. And well, then, yeah, yeah, keep, yeah, keeping the areas compact and contiguous. Um, other than that, if, if those are taken care of, then other considerations may come up. So for scenario one, uh, you can, for each scenario, we're going to have a purple outline. And the purple outline is the current trustee area to help identify where the changes occurred. So here in scenario one, the change occurred in the blue area and the purple area. Um, so that's around like Southeast Street and Ball Road where, um, let's jump over to the considerations. So. This scenario is drawn in consideration of mount, uh, minor boundary adjustments to bring the district back into compliance. So what happened here is we decreased area four and expanded area five uh, to bring, again, the district back into compliance. Um, in this scenario, Roosevelt Elementary moved from area four to area five. Um, a noteworthy detail is that this area has three majority protected class um, for the Hispanic Latino community and five plural plurality Hispanic areas, and we'll talk in detail what that means. Uh, this scenario has a variance of 7.9%, and the majority protected class areas are area one, four, and five. So uh, we went ahead and circled where those majority protected class areas are in trustee area one um, at 53.5%, area four, at 52.9% uh, and area five at 52.7%. So what that means is when the CVAP, the actual eligible voters are above 50% for a protected class, that qu qualifies them as a protected majority area, meaning that their representation is much larger than any other demographic in the area. Um, however, when we're talking about total population, then, then we're talking about plural areas where the demographic of a protected class is above 
And because the district's demographics is predominantly Latino Hispanic, each area has a total population of a plural district. However, there's not enough eligible voters for every area to be a protected majority area. So in this scenario, we have three of those. Uh, this, again, this scenario has a variance of 7.9%. So scenario two, again, the, the outline is in purple. The changes occurred in uh, trustee area one. The yellow trustee area uh, two were kind of expanded in the, in the green. Trustee area four and trustee area five, which is the purple. And again, this scenario was drawn with minor boundary adjustments by moving Jefferson Elementary School into area one and Mann Elementary into area two from area one. Uh, and by balancing the number of schools with, e with each area, or at least attempting to. Um, actually, a noteworthy detail of this one is that it creates four majority protected class areas um, based on total population in CVAP, and then it has five plural areas for the Hispanic Latino community. Uh, this scenario has the lowest variance at 6.3%. So we jump over to the data table. Uh, we went ahead and circled those majority protected class areas where you can see it's about 50 to 54% amongst each area with trustee area three only having 34.5 um, um, for the CVAP and the Hispanic Latino community. So, um, yeah. And then jumping on to the final scenario, uh, this scenario has changes to trustee area one which is the yellow, uh, trustee area four, the blue, and trustee area five, the purple color. And then uh, this scenario was minor boundary adjustments to decrease area four and expand area five to bring the district back into compliance. Jefferson Elementary moved from area four to, into area one, and Roosevelt moved from area four to area five. Uh, this one creates three majority protected class areas and five plural districts. And then uh, this scenario has a variance of 7.7%. And here's a demographic breakdown of that. And we went ahead and circled the CVAP for uh, area one, four, and five, and the breakdown of the demographic table. And a quick summary, uh, the district, uh, Dr. Downing was actually, and his, and his staff was really, uh, gracious enough to host 14 sessions for community input. Um, so it was seven days at different elementary schools and two meetings offered per day. And, and out of that, we had a total of 44 participants, uh, either virtually or in person. And uh, here we provided a summary of the AM and the PM attendance and then the totals within that. And then I'll just jump over to Dr. Downing so he can explain. Uh, thank you, Angela. Mm -hmm. Additionally, uh, the recordings from the meetings are posted on their website. We've sent out reminders uh, to the parents at the schools. We also, in our district-wide family letter, included another copy of the link where parents, can, parents, family, community can submit feedback. And uh, again, we have collection boxes in the offices of each of the seven schools, as well as a card which allows participants to identify which of the scenarios they prefer. So we will be collecting those boxes at the end of this month and summarizing all of the responses and bringing that back to the board at the February 9th meeting. Uh, we took thorough notes based on our December meeting and all of the requests, and we believe we've met them in terms of engagement. And then now we open to questions. And then with us today, we also have uh, Mr. Ron uh, Weinhardt, who's all um, counsel, um, who can answer any legal questions, and I can answer any questions regarding the demography portion. Board members, any questions? Thank you. Um, uh, my only question is regarding the um, the written correspondence boxes that are available in the offices, is there also an electronic email uh, way that 
residents can correspond with us that way? Yes, there's a link on the AESD website, also on the seven impacted schools, if you will. And as I mentioned a little earlier, we sent out a reminder in our family letter. Um, we also sent out information in our staff letter as well to solicit input from our staff. So uh, we continue to communicate it. It will remain on our website until you know, we close the survey process at the end of this month. Okay, at what time were the AM and the PM meetings, was it? We worked with the school administration and held the meetings at the typical time that they offer. So the times varied, but it was specific for each school based on their, their ongoing meeting schedule. Okay, thank you, that's all. Thank you. Any, any, any other questions? Go for it. I'm just uh, curious, when all is said and done, that um, is the cabinet planning, or, or Dr. Downing, are you, you are planning on bringing a recommendation forward to the board, or? Yes, we, we will collect the data, um, summarize it, and then in our presentation on February 9th, we will do another presentation, and um, at the leisure of the board, we can provide a recommendation. Uh, one of the things that I think was very effective was the summary of, first of all, the objectives uh -huh. and looking at the tables to see not only the majority areas but the plurality areas. So as a board, we have to determine uh, which of those are our priority goals in terms of balancing out the districts. Thank you. Thank you. And if I could, just as an update, Right now, the feedback we've received is fairly evenly distributed. Um, so to this point, there is not one. We would encourage everyone that's watching, please uh, provide your feedback to us. But even though feedback is provided, it's, it's gonna matter, but it's still, it, all of the um, things that are supposed to apply are still gonna apply and we're still gonna have to, whether one is popular, <laughs> it's gonna come down to also what, of the criteria the mm -hmm. which is contiguous and which um, balances out in the in the the data reflecting the uh, voting age groups and minority majorities and those kinds of things are all gonna because uh, I, I know a lot of people I know are just kind of like they look at it and they are smart enough to read everything around it but it's also kind of a well I would like my school to be here or there or, you know it's kind of a contest mm -hmm. too so. and you know um, Certainly, Mr. Winkard is joining us, but one of the things that we've made very clear in our meetings is that uh, the selection and the choice does not impact the school of attendance for families. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we've emphasized that this board supports all of our schools and will continue to do so, regardless of which one is, is represented by which board member. So that's something we just continue to emphasize so that everyone knows this is simply uh, you know, a, a mandated process, but our board is gonna continue to support all schools. I think that the feedback is great. I really appreciate that everybody's getting to you know, have a voice in this and say um, what they like or what they don't or what they would like to um, see shifted or you know, based on the new data. So I think that's really important. And um, I guess that was, it, I was gonna ask about the, in area one where there's, you know, the schools across the street from a large portion of a voting area. Are any of the other uh, of my colleagues' districts impacted like that? I'm are, sorry, are you aware? What, was, what was the question? The schools in across? In district one, uh -huh. which is, happens to be my district, but forever mm -hmm. who, who comes along, mm -hmm. there's a large portion of voters across the street from Jefferson but the line is, I believe, is that, what's, what is that, is that, um, the school is in another district. So I had people often come up to me at community meetings and want to talk to me about Jefferson, and I always did, but I would say, well, let me also include at the time, it was this goes way back to D.R. Haywood or Mr. Lopez, and there was confusion because actually I was on the ballot, but the, the representative was uh, somebody else. So it was a little confusing and uh, I just wondered if 
did anybody else have that issue or was it just district one? It happens in my district as well. Like for example, where I live, my- Where, right? No, my boundary where I live is Horseman, but I actually um, don't represent Horseman, even though yeah. I live there. So it's kind of similar, yeah. I, I think that, um, I think it comes down to kind of educating your constituents and understanding that the board has a fiduciary duty to represent the district as a whole. So it's not just because your boundary falls within a certain school that you only represent that school. Well, the other four, four board members also represent that school too. And I know it can be really confusing when you have congressional redistricting and, and uh, county redistricting and where those are like who you vote for, that's who represents you, that's who you file grievances to, but we have an education code that protects us from that that allows us to um, kind of relay that to the, to the constituents. But to expand on that, and I understand mm -hmm. that, and, and you know, I was in the position to, to do that, but I can also tell you that when, um, when voters are, you know, voting, they are, the reality is, is it is a district, and there is a representative, and they're expecting that they are voting for that representative, so, you know, while, while understanding that we do at large, mm -hmm. it was, it did cause um, some problems and some angry communities. So I look at the thing that says uh, communities of interest, and I know that means something else, but also a large voting block is a community of, of, of interest, sort of. So I, it, it was, it's, I've lived with it for, you know, okay. six years, but um, I just was curious because I never really knew if anybody else on the first set of uh, our maps and boundaries if and and so I'm kind of surprised that you actually were in that situation where you're asking people to to be their representative but then you're not really their, their representative mm -hmm. okay okay so it wasn't just area yeah. one so there was also I, I think it was also area correct me if I'm wrong I think it was area two and three as well right with like the where because I always no. thought the where was like no. yours or and you're like, no, actually, it's so and so. It's yeah, one, so it, it's, a little it's right across the street. So, um, I do just want to say that um, to piggyback off of board member Philbeck's comments in regards to having input, I applaud uh, everybody having input. Um, mm -hmm. But I do once again want to applaud Chris and the messaging coming across, which is that yes, I get it. You know, um, people want their representatives from certain districts, etc. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that this is the law. And unless the people are gonna pay our lawsuit once we get sued for basically just having it designed a certain way uh, because they feel that way, um, you know, I feel a lot of ways too. But like the law is the law and we should basically make sure that we're utilizing um, the considerations of the percentage breakdown of mm -hmm. our groups that are special interest groups that we're looking at. Um, I do just wanna commend you and just say, I really like the layout and the breakdown of reading the data. It's very friendly and it's mm -hmm. very clear. Uh, so I just applaud that um, overall and uh, I really like the whole issue of the considerations as well because of the fact that you know obviously if our if if our community in Anaheim Elementary if the majority is like Latino you know well that's how I'm voting you know what I mean like that's yeah. what I want like to represent the community um, so I, I do like how you break it down um, in regards to the noteworthy details and whatnot uh, of the total population and the CVAP data. Um, and I just want to say thank you for that. And Dr. Downing and team, um, when we continue to talk about this, you know, please make sure that everybody understands that, um, like, I mean, I don't not visit a school because of the fact that I don't represent them. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I represent them. We're supposed to represent all of our schools overall. Um, however, that's just our particular specific area. And so I applaud basically us making sure that we're approaching it with that attitude of yeah. all of our schools are ours. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I'm just one person and I mean nothing unless I have the other four, right? right? So I'll just piggyback on that to say generally, and we've all done that, we've all you know gone all over the district. About the only time that it becomes an issue is when maybe there's a parent has a problem or something, that's when and then they come to you and that's at least how it was for me and I would say yeah I'll, I'm certainly going to help you and 
check this out, but I'm also going to include Mr. Haywood or Mr. Lopez, and they're like, why? Well, because actually they are the representative of the school so mm -hmm. it wasn't it never is a problem when everything's positive it, it and and the t times weren't you know luckily we don't have a lot of issues at our school so the times were few and far between but that was about the only time that there ever that it ever kind of broke down into mm -hmm. well why are you including somebody else when um, you're my representative well I'm, actually I'm not but I am but I'm not <laughs> so it, it got a little confusing because you know right. we've all said we we um, govern at large. I mean, we on this board, all schools mm -hmm. are the same to us, and so. Yeah. But just to kind of clarify that, that's the only time that there was ever an issue is maybe when there was a problem that somebody wanted addressed. Yeah, and and I can definitely see that. And as an ex as an example, I had a previous client where we could break down the schools in individually by trustee area to where each trustee had an equal amount of schools within their attendance boundaries because it just the population total just worked that way um but however after like further you know review and and still using the same language of i represent this area or he represents that area um it, it the, the consensus was we want multiple trustees touching multiple boundaries to to kind of get that message across um so maybe that can help got it thank you Okay, I don't know if it's a typo in the presentation. I'm noticing it on page eight, mm -hmm. where it says a noteworthy detail. There are five majority Hispanic Latino areas and five that are plural, uh, plurality. And then in the CVP down, there's only three circled, but there's, it says that there's five. So uh, A noteworthy detail is that areas one, four, and five, which are based on total population and CVAP, there, oh, okay, yeah, it's, it's a typo. It's, and I, I think I've seen you. this document uh, distributed, and it did say three, and it did match the graph, but I just wanted to make sure that the, nothing changed and that I'm okay. understanding it correctly. Uh, we'll get that fixed. Thank right, you thank for pointing you. that out. Okay, no problem, yeah. Oh, that's a big That's, that's a big, big difference. Yeah. That's why I thought it was noteworthy to mention that it's not matching. But I, I do recall no seeing it match in the past. So. Yeah. Any other concerns or questions, phone numbers? All right, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Have a good evening. All right, so it's recommended that the Board of Education declare a public hearing to receive input from the public and the board members regarding the, adjust, the adjustment of trustee area boundaries for the 2022 election. Written comments up to 500 words must have been received or submitted online and by 12 p.m. today. Uh, but there weren't any comments, right? At this point, do I open it up to them as well if they have further comments? Or we are good. No? Okay. All right. So after hearing no comments from the public and after board, uh, the board discussion, I now adjourn the hearing and give notice that a vote on this item is scheduled for the February 9th, 2022 meeting, regular board meeting. Okay. Let's move on to item E, uh, the governor's budget proposal for 2022-2023. And I think we have M Matthew Slusser, Director of Fiscal and Administrative Services here. So good evening, uh, Board President Alvarez and Board of Trustees. Um, tonight I'm going to be presenting uh, the governor's proposed state budget and really how it uh, impacts us here at AESD. Um, a little background on the budget. Um, when the governor gave this budget on January 10th, it was almost a three hour presentation. It en encompassed multiple areas of the state and all the different uh, places where funding is needed. Um, a few of the um, key topics for the governor was addressing uh, COVID-19, um, the homeless crisis, cost of living, especially for lower income families, and then making our streets safer. Among that, the entire budget is $286.4 billion. 95% um, of this funding comes from personal income tax for the top uh, earners in the state, followed by sales and use tax, and then corporate tax. Um, the governor also um, is setting aside $34.6 billion in reserves, uh, which of that $9.7 billion um, is in the school stabilization reserve. One of the most important pieces of the governor's budget, um, which uh, for us here at AESD is ADA funding. Um, 
if you look at the on the slide at the left uh, gra or the left the left box, um, our fiscal year and then followed by actual ADA, you can see we've had a steady decline um, over the past four years as well as moving forward. Um, for 2021, we were held harmless. Um, the way the LCFF funding formula currently works for us is we are funded on the better of the current year or the prior year. So for 21-22, our ADA is 13.4 um, million, but with that, we're funded at the 15,579. Um, so on the box to the right, under our current law for the 22-23 um, fiscal year, we will be funded at 13 point four um, or 13,400 um, ADA. Um, the governor does have a proposal. Um, there's multiple proposals um, throughout the state, uh, speaking with colleagues at the state level as well at the local county offices. Um, the governor's proposal of a three year rolling average seems to be what will come into place. And with that, um, our funded ADA would be 15,013. Um, so this is a difference of 1,565 ADA, a potential increase from what is current law to what is um, in the proposed law. There's also um, legislation on different senators pushing bills that would um, uh, be enrollment based. Um, it doesn't appear that those will go through. Um, this is still a preliminary budget, but it looks like it's going to be a three-year rolling average um, for us for funding. So, I'm sorry, do you want me to wait for questions? No, you can, if you, no, go for it. So my question is, and, and please speak to me like I'm a layman here, in regards to the governor's proposal versus the current law and the difference between that. The governor's proposal in the three-year average, you said? Correct, yes. Okay, so that would actually be super beneficial extremely us. extremely okay. beneficial yeah the so who do we need to write letters to right no. <laughs> yeah it, the governor in that law that's the scenario that would best suit us it'd be your current year the proposed law would be the current year um the prior year or a three-year rolling average that three-year average would be um be the most beneficial to us yeah that's a huge decrease in funded um ada for us So with that, uh, the cost of living increase, um, for 2021, we had a 5.07% increase. For 22-23, um, in our multi-year, it was originally projected from Legislative Analyst Office of 2.48%. That is now uh, projected at 5.33%. Um, with that 5.33% um, increase for COLA, um, I'll give a scenario. For this fiscal year, 21-22, our LCFF funding is 189,500,000 approximately. Um, if the current law um, continues on to where we're funded at the, the better of the current or prior year, that will actually be a drop of $17.2 million for us. Um, if the three-year rolling average becomes the law, that will be only an increase of $2.5 million compared to what we're, we are receiving in this fiscal year. So while the COLA stands out that it's significant, you also have to factor in the ADA and um, our funding and that, that does impact. Um, next item down, uh, both STRS and PERS for our certificated classified staff. Um, there's a significant increase to, to the rate for that, right? So it's um, almost $3.7 million increase just for keeping the same staff that we have now, uh, just an added on cost. The governor did not um, propose um, helping out districts on that end, so that is a cost that we will you know, incur moving forward. And it also kind of mitigates that COLA that would be coming our way. Again, this is all preliminary, but with the different funding scenarios, the COLA does not have that huge impact because of our ADA. So a few other funding considerations. Um, the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program Grant, um, that, that's continuing on. That's that same program like Dr. Moreno as rolling out to the sites, really good stuff. It's my understanding it's a five-year commitment and funding will increase with that. So um, that's something 
good to look forward to on the horizon, you know, for keeping that nine hour school day and keeping our students engaged. <clears throat> Universal TK is another uh, item there. Um, for 22-23, we would be able to capture um, ADA up through, um, if the student turns five on or before February 2nd, um, we would get funding for that from the beginning of the year. Currently, if a student does not, if a student turns five after December 2nd, we cannot claim ADA for that student in TK until they become of that age. Next item, state preschool. Um, enrollment, it's, it's projected to include two-year-olds. So right now it's three and four-year-olds, but to also include um, two-year-olds as well. Early literacy grants, and this would really affect us here due to our underserved uh, population of students. Uh, governor is proposing $500 million um, to train and hire uh, reading specialists, um, as well as $200 million in grants for um, multilingual classroom libraries. So with our DLI programs, that would be a, you know, a great thing to have as well. Universal meals for students um, for 22-23, uh, two meals a day will be offered. Um, I know we contract with Anaheim Union High School District for our food services, um, but with that, any, any shortfalls in funding from the National School Lunch Program would be picked up by the state. Um, there are also uh, monies for expanding cafeterias as well that we could apply for. Um, Excuse me, the yes. universal, that would be every student, every single student. Correct. Right? Yes. Okay. Transportation funding, um, and this would also, due to our demographics of um, our area and our underserved population of students, um, we would be at a high priority for receiving, and it's at least a $500,000 minimum, but um, grants for busing and um, charging upgrades um, for those buses. So that's welcoming news as well. Another item not listed, but is school facility funding. Um, so for our state matching funds with our bond program, um, the wait list is, it's, is very long. The governor proposes to fund Prop 51 state, grant or, um, state matching fund grants as well as for the first time contributing from the general reserves to um, fund those matching funds. Next items, uh, independent study. Um, that's a big, big item here at AASD and giving options for students, maybe possibly quarantined. Um, changes would give us more flexibility on contracts um, for parents to sign for students that are on independent study, as well as allowing synchronous instruction um, to generate ADA rather than um, the current like homework that is needed in order to, to generate that. Um, special education, uh, a 5.33% COLA is uh, welcoming news. Uh, for special education funding through AB 602 grants. Um, but as you know, special education, our numbers uh, appear to be going up every year, and so is the cost to help um, you know, provide for these students. Uh, TK staffing, um, for next year, it, the number is 12 to one for adults, so um, you would have to, of course, a certificated teacher and then possibly an aide, but a 12 to one ratio. And then uh, for 23, 24, 10 to 1. So that adds uh, cost to, to our TK program. Um, with the state doing so well and uh, for Prop 98 funding being over the 3% amount, uh, it could possibly kick into uh, us having a reserve cap of 10%. So 10% of our general fund budget is two months of payroll. It's really not a significant amount for us, especially if cash flow pro problems um, come into hand with the state or you know, any uncertainties moving forward. Um, inflation and supply chain. Inflation is, as you know, the cost of everything is going up, so we're paying more as well. Um, and supply chain issues with us being able to get what we need um, is also you know, problematic. Really have to plan, work together to, uh, to get items and um, there's lo the long lead times, it, it hurts us. COVID-19 unknown impacts, um, you know, as every day something new is changing, right? So um, with that, we don't know what to expect, what's on the horizon. So we try to plan and uh, do as best we can uh, to mitigate 
any, any unknowns that will be coming up. So the next steps uh, for our budget um, is continuous review of revenue and expenditures. Um, I just want to give a shout out to our, and thank you board for our supervisor of fiscal services with this additional position. He worked with Tracy uh, Golden and they secured over $1 million in additional COVID relief funding. So it's nice to, yeah. <laughs> nice to have that and uh, for us to, you know, putting, putting all that, the extra staff to good use. Um, we will also, we are currently working on projecting enrollment and staffing for 22-23, uh, working with sites on that with uh, Ms. Mellon and her team. Um, our audit report for 2021 will be presented to you next month. So that's coming shortly. Uh, second interim will be pre presented in March. It's as uh, January 31st, so we are already working on that now. Um, and then in May, we will assess the governor's revised, uh, May revise, and uh, with all the trailer bills and other items that follow from this proposed budget, uh, we'll have a more fine-tuned um, picture of what to expect for 22-23. And then um, we are continually working on the 22-23 budget. It will be presented in June, but we're already anticipating costs and all the other items that feed into that. So with that, I will open it up with any questions you may have. Okay, I think we're, uh, we're good, but thank you so much for all your work on this and thank you for uh, taping up today and doing the whole presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you everybody for being here. Thank you. Great job. Thank you so much. Okay, let's move on to item F, uh, AESD uh, safety update. Tracy Golden, Senior Director of School Safety and Operations. Thank you, Tracy. Okay, good evening, members of the board. Um, I'm here to give you some updates on uh, the COVID safety protocols that we have in the district and to give you some testing and vaccination um, updates as well. So uh, first of all, we've had uh, in December and January four vaccination clinics, and you can see the numbers there. Uh, very happy um, with California Department of Public Health. We're working with Color Health, and I just want to note that the Ponderosa Clinic that had 116, they said that that was their um, highest OC uh, record for a clinic, so we were really happy about that. So we've been running those, and I'd like to uh, give a shout out to the um, administrators at those sites, because they're the ones that are really organizing it and, and getting that going and advertising it. Uh, we do have upcoming vaccination clinics. These are three weeks out from the original ones on the previous slide so that students and, um, and adults, so we have both, uh, can come back for their second shot um, in the three-week period. So those are coming up in January and February. Our on-site COVID testing continues. Um, we're testing at Key and all the, the school sites still, and you can see the numbers have increased significantly. Uh, we have increased our testing at Key to include Monday through Friday, and we are also still sending out testing teams um, twice a week out to the school sites to test there also. So you can see uh, the week of January 3rd, which was the week before we came back, uh, we did about you know 1,800 tests. Uh, January 10th for that week, we did 2,000, and the week of January 17th, you know, 2,057. So um, if you remember previous uh, presentations, they hovered around like maybe 500. So we've increased quite a bit. Also, the state provided us with 16,000 at-home COVID-19 uh, test kits that were uh, for students to have. So each school site hosted a grab and go on the 7th of January, again, right before we came back. Um, we also had a second distribution on the 14th and we handed out um, those kits to our families so they could use them kind of as a screening to see if um, you know, anybody was positive or if they needed to check and make sure that they were able to stay home and not come into school while they were positive. Also, uh, we are um, increasing our supplies to staff and we're gonna be providing uh, the N95 masks, surgical masks, and more hand sanitizer. And we have plenty of that um, supply in the warehouse. So thank you to uh, Matt and his team to make sure that they all have that. And um, 
you know, it's, it's available for any staff member and student who needs them. Okay, so on January 14th, the Orange County Healthcare Agency um, updated their health orders and had some revised guidance for the COVID-19 um, quarantine, isolation, things like that. So two significant changes really for us. Um, for the quarantine period for positive cases, and this is for students who are positive and also staff who are positive, there's still a 10-day quarantine. You can come back on the 11th day as long as your symptoms are better, you haven't had a fever for 24 hours. But now you can shorten that 10 days to five days, six days, seven days, if you can provide a negative test. So starting on day five, if you provide a negative test and your symptoms are better and you're fever free, then you can come back to school. So um, our HR team, it's working with the um, uh, employees and our school teams working with the students are monitoring that. So on day five, people are able to shorten that quarantine if they can provide that test. Another um, big change for us is in how we are notifying close contacts, and this is for students. So under the previous guidance, when students were a close contact, there was a positive case, and we had to interview and find out who those close contacts were individually, and then talk to the parents, and we had some quarantine options. If you remember the modified quarantine at school, they could quarantine at home. They've now changed it to what we call a group tracing approach, which means that if a group of students is indoors for 15 minutes or more with a positive, COVID positive person, then the entire group is notified. They still continue to come to school, um, but they um, you know, are asked to wear a mask, make sure that they're monitoring their symptoms, um, and also you know, recommending testing during that time, but they can still come to school. Um, Preschool, just to note, hasn't changed. They're under a different guidance because of their age, and so they still require a 14-day quarantine. This is for exposures at school, so if somebody at school is positive. Okay. If a student is exposed to a COVID-positive person outside of the school setting, and they are not fully vaccinated, then they do have to quarantine at home, but they have two options. They can do the full 10 days, come back on day 11, and no testing is required. Or they can shorten that if they come back with a negative test on day five or later. So, um, but if you're fully vaccinated, which is two weeks after the second dose of the vaccine, then students who come in close contact do not have to quarantine. They just need to uh, monitor their symptoms for 14 days. And if they um, are, do, are vaccinated, they do need to present that to the school so the school knows that they do not need to quarantine. Okay, and those are kind of the major changes that we had in the, um, the orders. So um, I'd like to open up to any questions you might have. No questions, just comments. Uh, great work, Tracy, always. Thank you. You're doing a great job, everyone is, that's working on this. And um, uh, it, I did have a family member that tested positive, fully vaccinated. And I had been around them, so I did use the key facility. And I, I know that um, there's a lot more, obviously a lot more people going through, but it was really smooth. And um, it was just great. I mean, I was in and out and didn't mind waiting a little bit. Everybody was patient, but yeah, there was a lot of people going through, but um, you guys have just fine tuned this. And I know it's been a work in progress for a while, but you really are there. You really got it going. Mm -hmm. um, very, very well, and I think it's helping to, I know it's helping to keep us all safe, and and so I just wanted to say I appreciate uh, what you're doing and what this district is doing to try to, you know, help us all get through this, so thank you. Thank you. Definitely, we're all, we're all grateful for all the work you're doing. Um, I, I can say that the district's resources have saved me from a lot of panic and worry throughout these past months. So if it's doing it for me, I know a lot of families are feeling the same. So it's always wonderful to know that the work that you are all, all involved in and reacting to mm -hmm. does affect our families and brings peace of mind in, in cases that are severely traumatic. So it is appreciated. Thank you. All right. Thank you. 
All right, these presentations will be posted on the district website uh, Board of Education page by tomorrow, just in case anyone out there wants to review them. Um, okay, let's move on to item eight, consent calendar. Items listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and are acted on by the board in one motion. There is no discussion of these items unless a, a member of the board, staff, or public requests specific items to be discussed and or removed from the consent calendar. Are there any, any items any board member would like to pull at this moment? None? Okay. Uh, that being said, uh, it is recommended that the Board of Education approve and ratify the following consent cal calendar items. Can I get a motion? So moved. Relis. Second. Okay, a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, uh, motion passes 5 0. Thank you. All right, let's move on to action calendar. 9A, superintendent's office, none. Uh, 9B, educational services. It is recommended that the Board of Education adopt resolution number 2021-22-20, declaring the month of February as Make Kindness Contagious Month. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor of, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, any abstentions? Motion carries, 5-0. Okay, let's go on to the next. Uh, it is recommended that the Board of Education adopt resolution number 2021-22-21 in support of Read Across America 2022, scheduled for March 2nd, 2022. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. So uh, motion and a second, any discussion? Just that I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> I was going to say, this is uh, Trustee Philbeck's uh, highlight of the year, so yeah, like, I hope we can do it in person. <laughs> and, and, you know, for all these years, all the little notes that I've gotten in the little books, I have saved, I want everybody to know, I've saved every single one. And sometimes yeah. I just go through them, and they're so cute. And I just, I love that day. So. Yeah, it's always a lot of fun. Yeah. All right, that being said, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion carries 5-0. All right, let's go on to C, SELPA, none. D, human resources. It is recommended that the Board of Education adopt resolution number 2021-22-22 for the establishment of criteria to determine seniority among certified, uh, certificated employees with the same seniority date. So moved. Okay, second. Second. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. Any discussion? I have a, a question, I guess. Um, is this basically, uh, new law or is this something usually that we'd have to do in bargaining or why are we doing it right now this is something that we do every year and it's in preparation of potential layoffs ah march 15th um, and, and we also yeah. use this uh, as a tiebreaker if we are doing transfers and we have two people with the same seniority and we need to do a tiebreaker now uh, can i ask you this Una, in the sense of like if we do this every year like does it expire or how does this work or is it just a resolution to fair warn everybody and Okay. That's really what it is. Just okay. to remind everybody that we do have this and to change if we need to or modify. We haven't in the last couple of years, but um, we have had to. For example, when we brought DLI in, gotcha. we needed to add that to the tiebreaker criteria, but it has been the same for the last few years. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Motion carries 5-0. It is recommended the Board of Education approve the agreement between this district and Office of Administrative Hearing. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries. Item three, it is recommended the Board of Education adopt resolution number 2021-22 slash two three adopting staffing flexibility measures in accordance with governor Newsom's executive order n dash three dash two two effective through march 31st 2020. so moved second okay we have a motion and a second any discussion uh can you elaborate a little bit more on this sure it's a resolution for staffing flexibility it does only go through the end of march but it does help out for example one of the things that helps school districts is that um, substitute teachers without a credential that have the 30-day sub permit, they're now able to extend being in the same classroom for 120 days. Um, another thing is that student teachers don't necessarily have to be under the direction of a supervisor. 
um, supervising teacher during this time. If, they, if a district needs them to take over a classroom, they can work with universities to do that. And the other thing that is especially good for um, classrooms or for, for districts is that CalSTRS retirees are able to return to classroom service before they normally are. Um, it was part of his resolution so that we could get retirees back in the classroom quicker, which we have utilized so far. Sure, and does, does the board have to adopt this resolution in order to be effective, or is it just law, and we're just doing this to be supportive? Yeah, OCDE um, recommended that we do to put it out there so that we made sure that we let our district and our um, stakeholders know that we are in favor of this. Great, okay. Excellent. Any concerns or questions? No, awesome, I thank you so much. Great. Okay, all in favor? Oh, go ahead. Normally they have to, they have a waiting period when you retire that you, before you can come back. For how long? I, it's usually a year, I believe. Okay, so that's, that's what I was wondering. And then is there any restrictions on, um, and it probably wouldn't make the amount of hours, for itself, like some of the hours they can work? Like the hours are still there. There is the still a restriction on the, the amount of hours. Yes. Okay, any other concerns? Uh, okay. I just wanted to reconcile yeah. just one thing. Um, you mentioned 120 days for the subs, um, and this expires on March 31st. Yes, it does. Could you reconcile <laughs> that for me? Okay, all right, I, I just want to make sure that that I was. I wish I could. <laughs> okay, again, I'll defer to our, our math teacher, President Alvarez, but my math is, okay. Just want to see check. Lopez is Mr. Mathematician tonight, jeez. You are reading that correctly. <laughs> Impressive number skills. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries 5-0. Okay, let's move on to E, administrative services. There are none. And uh, item 10, board discussion. Board member activities related to school business. Let's start with Trustee Lopez. Thank you, President Alvarez, and feels good to say that. Um, my first uh, item was part of my uh, winter break I spent uh, out in the community a little bit um, just because it was so busy during the last semester for all of us. Uh, the first meeting that I attended was uh, actually uh, on December 20th. It was a Boys in Park closure meeting held by, hosted by the city of Anaheim to provide an overview background for some of the residents who live in the area uh, involving Roosevelt Elementary. Um, and there were about 20 to 25 residents who attended the meeting. Uh, Isela was there from our district to help represent as well and answer any questions uh, that residents had there. Uh, so it was a really good turnout. Uh, on December 22nd, uh, Wednesday morning, I attended another Los Amigos meeting, which um, I hadn't been to since March, um, but I did want to give them a very belated update on our spring um, return to schools because there were a lot of stakeholders in the district and outside the district who had some concerns, some questions, so I just wanted to give them a quick update um, since that was the first Wednesday since March that I actually had time to come back and, and, and debrief with them. Um, and with the caveat that we were also experiencing the beginning of the Omicron surge and, and monitoring that situation and um, fielded a couple of questions about that. Uh, for our uh, for the spring um, but it was also a, a good turnout and um, meeting went well uh, then I attended on January 12th the LCAP advisory committee meeting um, just uh, I think I did that one virtually um, I wasn't able to come in unfortunately so I missed out on the in-person for that um, but it looked like it was a good turnout um, from what I could tell uh, and then I attended, or I, I, I'm afraid to move this microphone right now, but uh, reading my list, uh, I got a, a notification about a fundraiser for Thomas Edison Elementary, uh, and I know several of you also did as well, and that was on Friday uh, at Epic Wings, so I was able to uh, support that school, just um, got a couple items uh, picked up for dinner, and then uh, on Sunday, uh, another fundraiser for one of our Ponderosa Pride students um, who is trying to raise funds for um, 
uh, STEAM program I was able to help support as well. So just meeting with some of the parents and the family there. Um, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lopez. Uh, Dr. McAuliffe? All right, thank you very much, Mr. President. I too ended the, attended the Edison fundraiser at Epic Wings, very delicious wings. Uh, and, and when I was there eating, I actually ran into a parent. Uh, her name was Adriana Pluma, and I did ask her if I could share what she shared with me. She was telling me how her family wanted to move to uh, Westminster, but they ended up saying, you know what, I think we're gonna stay in Anaheim uh, because of the amazing DLI program. And you know, not only are we getting you know students and families from outside of our district, but we're also keeping them. So that's awesome. I just wanted to share that. Um, I did do a school visit to Roosevelt Elementary, so I want to thank uh, Principal Roman for showing me around. Amazing campus. I even got a, a, a response on my social media from a Mrs. Martinez who has two children uh, from. Uh, uh, from Roosevelt and they just love the campus, uh, love the staff, and even commented that it's like a college campus. It looks like a college campus. It's, it's beautiful. Um, I was also inducted into the International Educators Hall of Fame, so I want to briefly thank Dr. Pat Adelikan and, and the Youth on the Move, Inc., and, and uh, the Office of Lou Korea's 46th Congressional District for this recognition. Thank you so much. And that's it. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Dr. McAuliffe. Uh, Trustee Reles. Thank you, President Alvarez. Um, so um, I myself have managed to avoid uh, COVID for the last two years or since whenever it came out. Um, but uh, when, <laughs> when I basically uh, went and returned from winter break, which I spent in the middle of nowhere in Utah in the snow, um, I basically came back, I was home for a week, and I got COVID. Uh, I got the Omicron, um, and I'm just thankful that I am fully vaccinated with my booster shots and everything, um, and I do feel very fortunate that the, um, the uh, how I felt, my symptoms were very mild in comparison to what I've seen other people have, and I firmly believe it's because of the fact that I've got this booster, uh, I have my immunizations, um, and whatever people think about those and you know me getting these shots and whatnot um i'm just thankful for them because of the fact that my mom who also turned 77 recently uh she also got it and she basically was able to uh weather it pretty well uh no problem just about a 48 hour time period where we're just super exhausted like i'm going to bed at 7 30 p.m exhausted um but other than that feel great so uh can't be too careful. Um, I've always been wearing my mask. I'm very good about that stuff. And I still contacted it. And it is what it is. But we're just moving on now. Um, with that said, uh, I wasn't able to really do a lot of things, including go into work. Uh, I worked from home uh, for about two weeks. Um, but it was great because of the fact that I was also able to touch base with some people who heard through the grapevine or whatever the case may be. Uh, they still called me and to just check in. They heard through the grapevine that I had COVID, whatever. Um, but while doing that, uh, we were able to also touch base and hear about other things. Um, and I'm referring to one of our uh, assistant principals over at James Gwen, Ms. Jessica Scott, who basically called to... Um, you know, wish us a happy administrative week, uh, or not administrative week, a happy school board week, um, and give us recognition, which I was like, wow, it is awesome. That's great. Um, but also to hear about the after school program or the expanded learning opportunity program there and how excited she is. And she was telling me all about the district and how awesome the district's been about it and allowing them flexibility and bouncing ideas off and it was intense and I had to tell her, hey, it's 7.30, it's my bedtime now. Uh, but uh, lots of cool stuff happening. So I'm very excited about that. Um, with that said, um, all of you as well, I'm sure, all received that nice email um, recognizing us for school board week uh, by a 32-year uh, veteran in our district, Mrs. Julie Klinkenberg from the Online Academy. Um, and I just want to just thank her. Um, that's really nice. Um, like I said, these are things that... I don't really think about and kind of just push through because every day is a different day for somebody. Um, and it's nice that she took time and gave us a shout out and I just really appreciated that. And of course, last but not least, uh, I had to make a cameo and just swing by um, over at Epic Wings. Um, 
I was able to pick up my wings and support Edison, even though I haven't gone there um, in this new year thus far. And on that note, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trustee Willis. Board uh, Clerk Gilda. Hopefully make this quick. Uh, I also had, I really planned a, some fun things these past couple of weeks at schools and and then boom, you know, close family member, test positive and I'd been around him. So had to kind of wait it out. I escaped it, I was lucky, but then a few family emergencies, but everything's fine. My mom's 92 and she's a sweetheart, but she's had a little bit of trouble, but we're okay. And it's true what they're saying on the news, don't have, don't do anything, watch yourself, don't have accidents. Try not to do anything that you have to go to the hospitals because they are full, there are no beds. And uh, my mom was in a hallway for 23 hours on a gurney, never got a bed. Luckily, we were able to take her home. So I'm just kind of warning everybody, be really, really careful. Um, don't do anything that you might get hurt. Just kind of lay low for now. But um, so I was disappointed that I missed some of the opportunities that I was looking forward to going out. So it, as, as usual, it came down to some webinars and things and the budget, um, Orange County uh, Department of Ed, there was a budget perspective workshop. And I think I've seen like three. There was another one today, Orange County government budget proposal. Um, there's been a lot of them, but you know what? I, I learned something new every time. Every time I hear it, I pick up something new and understand it more. So it, those are kind of great. Um, a chalk webinar, I've been listening to those for close to two years. They're always really good. And this was on the new year COVID-19 update. And as you can imagine, a lot of it was about the new variant Omicron and the surge we were experiencing. But a lot of good information. Um, the YMCA, we had a meeting and I'll just mention that we have a new president and CEO, Brent Finley. Uh, thank you, Dr. Downing, for meeting with him. And um, to let everybody know that we, if you're looking for our gala, which was, I believe, going to be February 4th, we have postponed that to April 9th, so there is no gala in February. Uh, PTA meeting at Key the other day, and um, it's just great. You know, I mean, I, rah, rah for the PTA. They're, they're just great, and all, they work so hard, so thank you for that. I, and also, uh, thank you to Julie for the, the really nice um, email. Those are just very, this kind of gives you a boost, especially when if you're having a rough day or something. I've gone back and read that a few times, so thank you. Um, the other thing is that, um, Tracy, I want you to know I've been joining the health series. Of what, I pick something every time. There's a cooking class or whatever, and I've been doing the total body transformation, and I wish that was could really happen <laughs> but it, it, it's a little misleading because it's not exactly about weight loss it's it's a 10-week series and it's really good because it's about uh, adjusting habits that aren't as good into habits that are much better and the simplest things and you know uh, I think everybody's getting a lot out of it so I do appreciate those uh, I really I, it's exciting you know when I look for those ooh maybe I can find something out. there's yoga there's everything on those so I think we're very fortunate to have that and I have been serving on the Orange County Committee School District Organization. I'll just say that's been a real wild ride. And um, stay tuned because it's not over. And we have another meeting tomorrow if anybody's interested. And so with that, oh, and thank you, Sunkist. Sunkist, thank you so much for the shirts. My special little note from Alicia, Alyssa and Christian. And then also thank you to my Franklin family for the Starbucks card. You guys are great. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much. Have a good week. Be safe out there. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Board Clerk Philbeck. Um, I don't have too much to add. I also attended the LCAP meeting uh, on the 12th. I did attend virtually. Um, I just, I, again, I appreciate that you're offering that hybrid uh, for those of us who can't make it in person. Uh, everything uh, always in order and well organized, so it's always appreciated to see the, the inclusiveness of our district and how we include our our partners, right? Um, I was able to attend two of the redistricting meetings where we uh, got the presentation from all the maps. Uh, so I did attend uh, the Revere one in um, person and I went to the Horace Mann one in, uh, virtually. Uh, exactly same same data that we got I was really impressed again with the amount of uh, uh, input we're soliciting from our stakeholders with regards to the cards, the boxes in the office, the, uh, the website being fully accessible. 
Um, we requested the links to the online meetings and immediately they were up. So everything always, always there to support our families and make sure that they do have as much input as possible. So I think we just need to work on how do we, how do we connect a little bit more to get them engaged, but that's always a, that's always a thing, right? So we, so we, we work hard to try to do that and that's evident and it's also appreciated. So um, just to end on the, uh, I just want to tell employees and staff and families out there, take a deep breath, right? Like we're still going through a lot and I know it's hard and going to work every day is tough. <laughs> and I think we all just have this understanding that we just gotta get through because we yeah, gotta get through. But I think sometimes we just kinda take a, take a deep breath. So that's what I'm feeling right now. So I just really do appreciate everyone in our community and our district that puts their whole heart into all the work that we do. A, to keep our families protected and safe and B, obviously to educate the children and help them grow and help them flourish even though they're going through a lot of traumatic times, right? So we're all here for them and we're all here for each other and I, I know that's, that's true. So that being said, that's my report. And then let's move to uh, future agenda items. Any items that we'd like to add to the agenda for next time? Hearing none, okay, let's adjourn the meeting at 944, thank you.